for anybody just tuning in, we're trying to get this up on our YouTube live. It'll take a couple of seconds and then we'll have the meeting get going. Okay. And I have muted everybody uh, and they are no longer able to unmute themselves, which is how the meeting will be conducted. Um, I'll explain a little bit about that in a second whenever we get this up. Uh, so we are live. And we're going to do a couple of little housekeeping uh, things with our board members, and then we'll get started. The person named Elizabeth's iPhone, is that Elizabeth Ashby? I've unmuted you. All right, I'm gonna put you back on mute. Elizabeth's iPhone, anybody? All right, so Jane and David, if you are both ready, we can get started. I'm ready. I'm ready. So, Dave, should I make my little announcement or did you want to do a couple of housekeeping chores? No, okay. Me or David? I'm no. a, you, I thought you were going to explain something, but I'm just going to get started because, um, you know, David and Halpern and I don't want to be on the screen all night. The first, this is the um, 
April meeting of the Landmarth Committee of Community Board 8. We have four applications before us. We are going to vote in the on the context and appropriateness of those applications within the historic district. And we're gonna get right started right away with number one, 38 East 73rd Street. This is the Upper East Side Historic District. David Turner, the architect application is for legalization of a rear extension built without permits. So that I see David Turner, Hi. you're the applicant. Okay. That's right, I'm the architect. Yeah. So do you want to get started? One thing we all want to know is when it was constructed and what the dimensions are. Um, uh, the building, well, the building itself is constructed in the late 1800s. The extension was constructed before the present owner bought the building. When was that? Uh, I, I believe that he bought the building about 15 years ago. So yeah. you would say 50, so that would be, let's say 20, that would be 2005? Uh, something, something like that. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. And then, and when he, uh, uh, he went and he did some uh, uh, illegal construction in the building uh, and uh, the building department came and gave him violations. And then- When, when did he get the violation? Well, I don't, have it, I don't have it in front of me, but he got violations a, a number of years ago, it might be maybe six or seven years ago. And then when we were hired to um, uh, legalize it, we found out from the, bill, from the landmarks that uh, the, the entire rear extension was not legal. And uh, there was an outstanding violation for that. And so we filed to take care of the, vi uh, we, uh, then, then the owner decided he wanted to change it into a one family building. So we did a filing that to get rid of the violations, to legalize the rear extension and to convert the building into a single family. But you're only here for the, um rear yard extension that's right that's right what are the dimensions of the rear yard extension well uh, the width of the building which i think is around i, I don't have it in front of me it's around 20 feet and the rear yard extension it goes out uh to the property line it's, it's about so, 20 by 20 foot extension 20 feet by 20 feet extension approximately yeah approximately. Okay. okay and how many stories one story one story so it basically covers most of the rear lot that, that, that's right in other words he doesn't have a yard there's no yard that's right okay do you have drawings um sure i submitted the whole package to uh, uh the board so a whole pack of photographs i understand you don't have a you don't have any drawings with you no, I have, I don't know how to, on Zoom, I'm not an expert at working with Zoom. I, I have drawings in the computer. I don't know how I would show them to you on Zoom. You follow what I'm saying? In other words, I can, um, I can pull them up uh, and put them up for everyone. If you give me okay, a great. Well, I think without drawings, we uh, can't apply. Okay. Yeah, they're all in the submission along with photographs. Uh, uh, I understand that, but normally um, the architect, even though he had submitted drawings, would also have a physical set with him. Well, in other words, how would I show that? Well, there's a way of doing it on Zoom. I, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> just, just hold on one second and I'll have it up for everyone. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. very good. This is 38 East 73rd Street. That's right. Okay, give me 10 seconds and it'll be up. Does everybody see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So David, you can continue. Yeah, okay. So as you could see, 
It's 19 by 17, the extension. There was previously a small extension there and they he, uh, whoever uh, built it uh, filled, filled in the backyard. And, um, and then uh, uh, when the new owner bought it, he did some illegal renovations within the building. He got a violation. When we went to file that violation uh, and sent it over to Landmarks, we discovered that uh, the extension was illegal also. So, and then the owner decided he wanted to, uh, not just to legalize it, but to convert the building to a one family. And that's the sum and substance. You don't have a photograph. I, sure, I have a bunch of Will, photos. is there a photograph that's included in? Um, sure, we have a lot of photographs there. Okay, keep going. That's a that's a photograph of a bub showing the uh, that is completely surrounded by taller buildings. And then if you look at the other photographs, we have photographs from the street showing that you can't see it from uh, any location. And we have photographs from above that we shot from the building above. I mean, the walls are completely covered with other walls. So we can't photograph the walls of it because they're completely uh, concealed. So could the pointer um, will be pointing exactly to the extension? Is that possible? Is, is well, this no, the no, no that's not the extension. That, those are photographs taken from the extension of the adjoining rear yards. So you don't uh, have a photograph of the extension. Well, yeah, there's nowhere to photograph it because it's covered by all the other buildings. So we got on we got on the roof of the building and photographed. There may be well, a wall, the wall, the I see the wall covered with ivy there in H. Where is the extension in relationship to that wall with the ivy on okay, it? Uh, uh, you see where the glass is, the greenhouse? No. Yeah, that's that, that, this? that the greenhouse right, right there. Yeah, the greenhouse. Oh, Sitting on the extension, sitting, uh, it, it, the greenhouse was on a, um, uh, on a, the legal uh, extension of the building and on the, uh, uh, to the side of it, it would be, is the roof of the illegal extension. And there's walls, uh, walls from adjoining buildings that uh, uh, shield it. But it looks like there's somewhat of a rear yard there, is there? No, there's no rear yard, not at all. Oh, so that what what I'm seeing with the ivy is across if, for, is, is across, the wall is the wall for the adjoining property that faces on to 72nd um, Street, I guess. Or? Well, if, no, actually, we're looking from the 73rd Street building uh, 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 south, and that wall faces the 73rd Street building. Okay. So that's the extent of your application. Uh, that, that's right. That's right. Okay, so it's actually a 17 foot wide, a 19 foot wide by 17 foot deep. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. Um, we normally would hear from the public next, Bill. Will I don't know if anybody from the public is there. Um, okay, this is where I should probably explain to everyone that uh, the way that the Zoom meeting will work, you are all muted. Um, it does cause a lot of uh, distraction when people are able to unmute themselves. And so in order to have a very organized uh, meeting, uh, Jane and David will call on people who raise their hand through the participants menu. Um, so if you are a member of the public uh, and you would like to speak about this application, if you can open up the participants menu, which is at the bottom of your screen, or if you're on an iPhone or a, a tablet by swiping over that menu, and then uh, selecting the raise hand feature, it looks like a little outstretched hand. Don't just raise your hand in your camera, we won't be able to see you. 
Um, but if you raise your hand through the participants menu, or if you're on the phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. And Jane and David will be able to see you raise your hand in order of the way that, uh, in order of the timing that you raised your hand. Uh, they will be able to then call on you to be unmuted, and then um, you'll be able to speak. So if anybody has any questions, they can chat me in the chat box and I'll be able to answer their questions. Um, but, uh, it, or you can email me at willbrightbill at gmail.com. I'll put that also in the chat so that people have it. But otherwise, well, Jane and David. Looking, um, at the participants box, I don't see any raised hands. So I'm assuming that nobody from the public wants to speak or is even present. So with that, we're gonna to go to um, community board members. And I'm looking at my list here. I think we'll start with you, Marco. Your hand is raised. I'm gonna unmute Marco. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, I saw the application that I just checked in the um, DOB web. Yes, it's true, and uh, it was a violation that was on 7 12 2005. And uh, I think he has to be in compliance with the violation, with the ECB violation. And since uh, it is also the, the property located in a commercial district, C5 1, so he can occupy as a right uh, the whole lot. And uh, seeing that I don't see nothing from outside, it means I don't have no problem with this application. Even though Thank they shouldn't do that, but I don't have a problem. Thank you, Marco. Next, I see Michelle. No. Michelle, you're unmuted. Did I hear Marco say that there is no mandatory uh, rear yard applicable for this application? The 30 foot rear yard is not applicable here? Uh, Marco is muted, so Jane, David, if you'd like me to unmute well, him. Well, but... Marco said it's in a commercial district. So, so, so does that mean that there is no rear yard mandatory? The 30-foot rear yard is not mandatory here? No, it is not mandatory. So are we, so the fact that there is no extension, I, I'm very uncomfortable that somebody <clears throat> did illegal building and you know to start with this doesn't sound like a very good neighbor um so i'm not enthusiastic about uh supporting that kind of action to start with but i'm equally uncomfortable because we can't even see it we don't have a visual of it because it apparently can't be photographed so for me this is a real dilemma I, I don't want to support something I can't see and something that I would usually not support simply because it was built illegally. So um, I'll be happy to listen what, to what others of my colleagues have to say, but I don't think I'm supportive of, the, of approving this. Thank you, Michelle. I just looked, it doesn't seem that any other members of the community <laughs> will raise their hand. So I'm just gonna, does Kimberly have a comment on this or Anthony? Can you, where's Will? Can you unmute Anthony? Yes, I'll unmute Anthony. Anthony, you you're Hi. Anthony? Yes. You didn't raise Hi, your can hand. you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yes, I did. Oh, I didn't okay. see. Um, I, this, uh, th this particular neighborhood is kind of a mess and, um, this particular block and there are lots of very strange, uh, and kind of minimal rear yards. Um, on the one hand, I agree with Michelle that it's not, um, <clears throat> that it's wrong to reward people who have done illegal work. But then again, the owner of this building didn't do this work. The current owner didn't do this work. And so in a way, it's kind of hard to punish them for what had been done before they bought it. Thank you, Anthony. 
Um, oh, David, I'll get to you at the end. I'm just going to ask Kimberly. Did you want to make? Does Kimberly want to make a comment? Will? Uh, she has raised her hand, so I'm going to unmute her. Okay. Thanks, Will. Thanks. Kimberly. Awesome. Um, I was just going to say that I agree with Michelle. I appreciate Marco's comments about, you know, the, the, uh, whether or not they're allowed to make this readition, but I don't feel like I have enough details to really approve this and be comfortable with it. Um, that's how I feel about this right now. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I'm just looking to see if there are other um, participants who are community board members who raise their hand. I'm going down the Jane, list. Jane, I think, uh, Elizabeth, are you on the phone? Elizabeth, uh, are you in, yes. ending at yes. 17? I finally got on about 15 tries later. But I, I didn't. Um... Oh. Uh, put my two cents in. Elizabeth, repeat what you just said. Sorry, you cut out for a second. Uh, am I heard? Yes, uh, you, thank you. But Elizabeth, repeat what you said because you you did cut out for a second. Uh, do you did you hear what I said, or do you want me to say it again? I want. Oh, okay. I, I I had such an awful time trying to get on this thing that I didn't see the application, so uh, I'm not worth hearing on this one. Okay, thank you. I know David Halpern wanted to speak and maybe Alita. Alita, do you want to go next? Alita, you're unmuted. Thank you. I have trouble for the reasons that Kimberly and Michelle expressed accepting. I th um, and David Turner could correct me at back in at some point years after the property was bought, there were violations from the DOB. It was known and I don't know at what point that this was in violation. If they're converting the building to a single family, then it is easy to change this or get rid of it. And I don't, then they've been enjoying the benefit of it for all of these years. It just doesn't feel right that something was illegal. There were no due diligence done when the property was bought or not enough. It just doesn't feel right to just grandfather it in when it's been illegal for all of this time and doing construction. So it's not as though the building is intact and they're leaving that way. Thank you. Thank you, Alita. David Halpern? No problems with it from the point of view that uh, apparently it meets the zoning because we don't need a rear yard and it's only a one floor extension. Uh, but I would like to know from David Turner, uh, if anything has been done to the roof, uh, apparently you can't see the walls but the roof has got to be visible, certainly from the people living in the building and also from people around who look down on it. And uh, would just be of interest to me to know whether they've many made any gestures to the visual environment uh, with respect to what they're doing with the roof. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, they did, it's a flat roof. It's got a parapet wall around it. And there's overgrowth from the adjoining buildings that cover it. Other than that, not, they're not doing anything on the roof. And uh, it's an L-shaped uh, extension because there's an existing uh, legal re rear yard extension that had a greenhouse on it. So, so uh, that roof is acting li almost like a terrace for the greenhouse. So it's, it's a, people can go out on the roof and use it That's as a right. terrace? That's right. Okay, thank you. What is the, what's the material? Um, uh, it, it is roofing. Uh, he did, they didn't pave it over or anything. It's just- So it's just a asphalt roof or something. Right, right. I think it's roll, I think it's roll roofing. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just make a comment because I think we're about to go to a vote. So somebody will need to um, introduce a resolution on this. I find it very disappointing that we couldn't even get a visual of the extension, a drawing or something that sort of showed exactly what it looked like within the backyard, uh, even though there yeah. is no backyard anymore. It just seems very odd that architect couldn't produce some kind of a visual for all of us. 
I understand the lack of familiarity with Zoom. It's a new experience for everyone sitting here. So um, I don't know what to say. I know it's not visible. I know it's a commercial district. I know it's been there now for 15 years, but I kind of tend to go with Michelle and Alita on this. So does anybody want to introduce a resolution? You can raise your hand. <laughs> Will okay, Michelle and then Marco have raised their hand. Okay, Michelle. I'd like Michelle. to make a resolution to disapprove for the reasons that you stated and some additional whereases. Thank you, Michelle. Second, was that a second, Kimberly? I mean, Marco had his hand raised. You want me to unmute him? Oh, Marco, go ahead. Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think I'm going to second, but uh, before uh, to continue, yeah. I would like to keep in mind everybody that um, uh, this applicant, he has a environmental control violation. And if we disapprove, I did, I agree completely, he shouldn't do that anything illegal. I'm not supporting that, I'm completely against that. However, I have to keep in mind for everybody that if we disapprove, the only choice that he has is he has to demolish what he built. And I don't know if it's reasonable that we have to support something that I just check again from the Google Earth that that is that section specifically this applicant he missed to express uh, his point of view in that section the, the it is a, like an strangulation of the of the rear yards and that is the only rear yard in that section there is a, a, on the far uh, from the lot there is a good a reasonable uh, rear yard but in this part specifically it looks like it's an independent uh, donut with very small. And I think um, personally, I, I, I feel reluctant to approve, to disapprove something that is kind of the owner he has to demolish. And I consider the penalization is too big. And that is why I probably, I will go in this in, uh, against the Michelle recommendation. But if somebody else wants to second, that's fine for me. Thank you. Marco, I appreciate what you're saying. My, my vote is based on the principle that the architect did not bring a drawing or a photograph or something so that we could all see exactly what the extension looked like. That's my negative vote is gonna be on that principle, not on the fact that the poor owner might have to take it down or whatever. I think the architect should have come with some kind of a drawing so we could see what it looked like. Well, there, there is a drawing of it. Well, not that we could see from the, um, did we get to see the section drawing or? Yeah, there's a section. If you look at the drawings again, you'll see it's very clearly detailed. What, well, uh, well, page, what page is that on, David? Well, I mean, if you go back through the drawings, it'll take a second to go through the drawings and you can see it. It's detailed. I'm gonna put that back up so everybody can see it. But David, I would like you to tell me when I am on the page that you would like everybody okay. to stop. Well, there's, there's a couple, there's a couple sections, but keep going. Well, I mean, I didn't, didn't even think we'd have to spend so much time on it. Keep going. That's yeah. the third. David, I have a question. Right okay. Is this within a hundred feet of the avenue? Uh, I, 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 I believe it is. We can look at the plot plan. The plot plan's here also. Yeah, it is. Because that says a lot about what that rear okay. yard doesn't have yeah. to be. Okay, uh, so is this what there's there? Uh, that, that's the roof. Uh, if you go further, you'll see the plot, the plot plan. Let, let's go uh, uh, further. You'll see the first sheet will have the plot plan on it. The first page? Yeah, the first place should have a plot plan. It'll show the distance to the corner. It's uh, within 100 feet of the corner. It's 83. <laughs> yeah, it's within 100 feet of the corner. So let's say. Let me say that, let's say he had to rip it down, it, it would be legal for him to build it back up again. Uh, 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 he could file to rebuild it. So to make him rip it down, so he's gonna rebuild it, it, it to me doesn't make sense. I, I, no, it's not a good visual, but it doesn't matter. I think we should go to a vote. Kimberly seconded Michelle's um, resolution. So I okay. think we go to a vote. Um, will, are you gonna call the roll? Sure, give me one second. 
okay. to change what we're viewing. And we're going to pull up the vote sheet. And going to So uh, Elizabeth Ashby, I'm actually going to lower Gail and Sarah Chu. I'm going to lower yours and Michelle Birnbaum's hand. Um, raise it again if, if there's something that uh, you need. Um, Sarah, I'm going to mute you for a second while I, Sarah, you're, you're welcome to speak while I pull up the yeah. Um, may I ask, is the is the resolution? I guess this is a. Um, uh, is it going? Is it a disapproval because we couldn't see or understand the application, or is it a disapproval as presented? Because I think that would affect how I vote. Uh, Sarah, I think it's a disapproval as presented for me at least because I can't see the very hard extension in that three-dimensional look. So many applicants actually will do a drawing or something of exactly how it looks. And I haven't seen that yet. I've seen the plan, but not sort of a um, three-dimensional drawing. So I'm so, I, that's my view. I don't know. Okay. All right, Thank that's all I want to know. Thank you. All right, I'm I gonna, oh. Call the roll, Bill, Will. Yeah, okay. Uh, Elizabeth Ashby, you're unmuted. Uh, not voting for cause because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, okay, one second. And then uh, Gail Barron, you're unmuted. Yes. Oh, please. Michelle, you're unmuted. Yes, for the disapproval, but I had raised my hand because I had an additional question, um, which which I know we're voting now, but these are unusual circumstances. So I hope you'll give me a little leeway because I did have my hand up. My question is, if this is going to be transferred or renovated to be a one family home, um, are we presuming that the only changes will be interior or are we expecting the owners to come back to us with an exterior plan? Because if that's the, I'm voting yes on this for the disapproval anyway, because to me, if it's unsightly or inappropriate or whatever it is, he may have the right to rebuild it because it's only 80 feet from, from the avenue. However, if he's coming back to create, to build a one family home, there'll be lots of plans to look at. And maybe we can come up with something that's far more aesthetic or we would disapprove it on the aesthetics or approve it on the aesthetics. So I think that's a question that we need answering. And I think it's, um, I understand, you know, the problem with, with what we're going through now and, and the electronics and all this, but um, uh, I'm disapproving, but I'd love the answer to that question. And also, Will, if I can just say, there's a way to do, uh, as you were just doing the screen sharing and in our old protocol, how we went from person to person for commentary at this particular committee, Jane and David, um, I, I think that we should continue that. Um, well, I, you know, I agree from with person you. To person. I get, um, Michelle, I tried to get everyone in. I guess I missed Sarah's raised hand, but that's what we're trying to do. I think we should proceed with the roll call. We're only voting on the violation, and it was a move to disapprove. You want me to answer that question? No, we're voting on the extension only. Thank you. Okay, next uh, is Alita Camp, but you're unmuted. Yes. Yes, sorry. Um, Sarah Chu, um, hold please, and I will unmute you. Um, Sarah Chu. 
Oh, sorry, Sarah. Yes. Yes. Yes, I heard you. Okay. Yes, sorry. Um, next, Anthony. Hold, please. Anthony, you're unmuted. Repeat. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, David Halpern. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Jane. Yes. Um, Marco, give me one second. I'll unmute you. Marco. Abstain. Marco. Abstain. Abstain. Thank you. Um, oh. Christina Davis, you're unmuted. Yes. And I, Kim Selway. Um, oh, please. And I will unmute you. Kim. <coughs> Kim. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was a move to disapprove. I think the applicant would have had a better chance if we'd had better visuals presented to us. Thank you. Okay, so I guess on the landmarks. Okay, so we're on to the next one. Will, are we ready? Yes, um, that applicant is Anique is Pearson. Anique, I'm gonna unmute you. Thank you, I'm here. Okay, so let me read it in. 106 East 78th Street, Upper East Side Historic District. Anique Pearson Architect. A neo grec style building designed by R.W. Buckley and built in 1879-80. Application is for work at the front and rear elevations. So I'm looking for a normal presentation and Will can bring up the drawings for you. I can bring them up myself. I, you I can do that, and that's even better. I'm going to try it right now. I'll uh, do a screen share. And bring up the drawing in full view. Can you all see the presentation? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, 106 East 78th Street, um, as you've heard, was originally erected in 1879. It was a painted brownstone, um, and it was one of three townhouses built by the same family, um, which are here on the right of the page, 110 East 78th Street, 108 East 78th Street, and our building in question, 106 East 78th Street as they appear today. So at the time, they were all built uh, in 1879, 1880. And our building at 106 was um, modified in 1937, where the modifications that took place were removal of all of the traditional neoclassical details. Um, so they the, they kept the cornice, but they took away all of the paneling and all of the moldings around the windows that were similar to the sister buildings next door. Um, the next page shows the context of uh, these three buildings and their 1940 photographs of exactly how our building at 106 looked after the details were removed. Um, whereas number 108 and number 110, its sister buildings uh, maintain the detail throughout all this time. And I'll go back to the picture of before, just so you have a reference that all of the details on the 110 and 108 are still intact, but uh, the detail of 106 is removed. Uh, my client would very much like to bring back the historic neoclassical appeal, uh, 
curb appeal, they call it, to this townhouse. Um, and, uh, and we're looking at its sister buildings as inspiration. Um, so just to quickly as context, uh, 106 East 78 is on the south side of 78th Street uh, between 108 East 78th Street right here and the tall 12 story building, which is 875 Park. Um, and from the block view, you see that most of the uh, center of the block has been filled in by additions and uh, 106 has the largest area of green open space in the entire block. Um, I'll go to this page, which gives it a little bit more context within the street. Uh, East 78th Street between Lexington and Park are full of townhouses of neoclassical design um, of all materials. There's brick buildings, um, there's limestone buildings, there's still brownstone buildings on the block, but as you can see it's very uh, homogeneously neoclassical in its style and uh, historic character. Sorry, wrong clicker. So this page shows what we would like to um, emulate. Uh, on the left is the elevation of the facade at the street as it exists today. It is a painted over, we think, painted over stone. Uh, very plain, flat stucco, no details on the windows, no, no moldings from first floor to third floor. Um, at some point, we think in the 1980s, they installed shutters on three floors above the ground floor. And again, taking inspiration from number 108 next door, we very much love the rusticated space with a projecting cornice above the front doors. Uh, we love the fact that this townhouse has shutters only on the first floor and um, we're very much inspired by the neoclassical detail of panels of between windows and um, divided lights, which we've lost some time in the past 30 years on, the, on our townhouse at number 106. So our proposal is to reintroduce uh, gridded windows, shutters on the ground floor, a projecting cornice, a railing for planters and greenery, we're going to maintain uh, two front doors. We'd love them to be uh, glass doors with metal grills. And, um, and at the moment, the two doors are at different split levels. One used to be an entrance to a doctor's office. The other one is the entrance to a uh, residence. Uh, we're also calling to convert the entire townhouse, which is ground floor doctor's office and single family residents to just single family residents. Um, this shows a bit more detail uh, on the front area way and a section through the street as we propose to take the entire area way down three steps across the full width of the townhouse and uh, it would still leave six foot two uh, clear space between the, the railing at the ground floor and the tree pit um, across from the townhouse. Um, the stucco color we're proposing is a beige color, a limestone color, such as this um, historic townhouse on East 80th Street, which is our, the closest match to what we, we have found in the neighborhood uh, that resembles what we're proposing here. Uh, in the Upper East Side Historic District. Um, if I, I'm going to go a little faster, I don't want to take everyone's time. So I'll, if you stop me, if you have questions, but um, this page describes how the areaways on 106, 108, and 110 are all, um, you know, encroaching on the sidewalk as it is, which is the character of the street on both sides. This is our existing condition area way. And this is a view looking toward 875 Park. And 875 Park has a granite wall that is um, 
six foot two away from the existing tree pits. So we wouldn't be expanding the area away any further than the granite walls at 875 Park. Uh, we would love to have an area away with plants, climbing wisteria, um, planters with plants, and uh, against the townhouse and also uh, against the fence for greenery, such as was done at 110. This describes a little bit more the character of the, of the sunken area way and our models that we've, inspired, we've taken inspiration from. Uh, originally of neo grec style, this townhouse was converted in 37 as a neoclassical design. So we've taken some neoclassical and inspired fences uh, with diagonals and rosettes and just used a simplified version of this railing for this townhouse, uh, which also resembles some of the detailing in, in the doors in the, in the neighborhood uh, that are glazed with metal grills. Um, these are just more um, blown up details of of the moldings at the windows, uh, the proposed shutters at the first floor with old-fashioned old L-shaped um, strap hinges in black iron. Mm. And an example of the mm. front door with its letterbox and its uh, metal grill with rosettes. Um, in addition to the front facade renovation, uh, we would like to modify the rear addition the rear addition at the moment is um, is is a two part addition. There's a two story uh, addition at the back on half the townhouse, and then there's a three story addition at the back, which I'll show you pictures of in the next uh, drawing. And what we'd like to do is number one, take the addition back to 30 feet clearance. So we're actually proposing to make it less deep than it is as it exists, and also less tall to have it only two stories high and not three stories as it is currently. Uh, the rear addition at number 108 is only two stories high, but it encroaches substantially into the 30 foot rear setback, but it's pre-existing. And at 110, uh, just to give you some context, at 110, uh, the rear addition is three stories high, and it extends almost the full depth of the lot. So our rear addition is still very much the smallest in the entire block. Um, this is uh, a plan comparing the areas of area way, uh, sorry, the rear addition that we would be removing in white and adding in black on every floor. So it's the first three stories, cellar, base, oh, sorry, cellar, basement, first floor, uh, two story high above grade. And then above that, we're actually removing a part of the addition that was there and just having a, a roof deck for a garden. So in total, we would only be adding 70 square feet of a rear uh, of square feet to the entire townhouse. Uh, these are pictures showing the existing rear addition as it looks. It's got the three story on half of its rear facade, two story addition on half of its rear facade. And compared to the other extensions in the back at 108, two stories high, extending much further out, and at 110, almost up to the roof, the rear addition takes up almost the entire rear yard. One thing we love about our, our pre-existing um, rear addition is its ventilated cornice, which we're proposing to restore, and um, it's red brick that we would love to have unpainted uh, for our new facade. So these drawings show existing rear facade and proposed rear facade with uh, new steel windows on two levels and then another third window set back uh, behind a terrace with new metal railings and its color renderings here. So here you have an idea of the materials, the brick color, 
uh, the property will have a new fence, property fence, lattice fence for growing uh, a garden greenery. And we're proposing uh, black windows, gridded windows and black iron for its railings. So this is my last sheet. Um, I'm open to questions if you have any. I ask one quick question before we open it up. <clears throat> Is it stucco all the way down in the front or is the lowest level, you talked about it being rusticated, is that stone or stucco? It's stucco. So Everything the entire, is stucco. The, the entire facade would be stucco all the way down with a rusticated stucco detail at the base. And was the building, building was originally stucco is what I think you said? Yes. It was a painted originally in 18, um, in 1780. It was, um, sorry, in 1879, I got those numbers reversed. It was uh, painted over brownstone. Okay. All right, thank you. I guess we should find out if there's anybody in the public who wants to comment. Now, I'll remind that if uh, there are people from the public who've tuned in after we started, the way you uh, can ask a question is you must raise your hand through the participants menu. The particip participants menu is at the bottom of your screen right now. It has a little number 36 next to it. If you open that, there will be an icon that says raise hand. It looks like a little up raised hand. You can click that and it'll bring you up to the top of our list so that we see that you have a question and then Jane or David will call on you. Uh, Jane, David, Grace Polk has raised uh, her hand. Well, <clears throat> please uh, give us your comment. Grace, please give us your name and your address. My name is Grace Polk. I live at 200 East 66th Street. I am a member of the church at 103 East 77th Street. The back of 106 East 78th Street adjoins our church property. And that's why I'm asking these questions. I sent these questions back on March 16th when the meeting was supposed to be actual instead of virtual. And they relate to uh, the extension. On the basement level, if you look on page 10 of the um, proposal, um, you will see that uh, there is some additional construction going to go on there below that, actually. Um, I guess the, yes, the basement is where the garden is. And in the cellar floor, you see the black area. Um, that's all new and it creates a large, what appears to be a large room at the back of the house. Um, we're wondering uh, what is going to be put in there um, simply because uh, we have uh, a river running under this property or a creek and um, our sump pumps are quite busy, you know, and so we are hoping that um, if there's any information about that particular room, it could be shared. And then above it on the basement floor, which is really the the ground floor, which has the garden in the back. Um, I see that there's a new tree planned for the southwest corner. There's an existing tree on the southeast corner. There you have it. And this is so exciting. And I just wonder what kind of tree you're planning. Because for example, a weeping willow sends its roots out to the plumbing system and to the pipes and so forth. So my concerns are not with the aesthetics, which looks lovely. I'm concerned with what's happening under the ground and possibly adjoining our property. So if you could enlighten me on that, I'd be very grateful. Anita, yes, I certainly can. You are not obligated to talk about anything except the design in terms of its appropriateness, but you're more than welcome to elucid elucidate. <laughs> I'm, I would be happy to. Um, uh, I know the block very well because I worked on uh, 119 East 78th and 
uh, learned from experience that there's a lot of groundwater uh, in the area. So this room is actually just storage, but um, the entire basement has underground drainage to a sump pump here in a mechanical room that will direct the water out. And we're lifting everything off the floor by six inches in case there's any there's any future flooding, you know, in our hundred year storms that happen every year now. Uh, on the rear garden, we're uh, really keeping everything almost as is, just straightening the lines. Uh, these are planter beds. Uh, we're keeping this area as green as possible so that the water can percolate through. Uh, this tree would just be really a bush. They have The owner hasn't chosen the species, but um, really the two large existing trees we'd love to keep and prune uh, and just plant a small um, decorative uh, shrub in the corner, nothing like these tall trees that are existing. I believe this is a locust, and this might be a um, a plane tree. I forget. Does that answer your question? Yes, I could see that from your pictures, from the photographs as well, that there were two very large trees already on the property. Thank you yes. very much. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Next. <clears throat> Anybody else from the public? And if you're on the phone, you can hit star nine to raise your hand. David Wu has raised his hand. Mr. Wu, please give us your name and address. D. Wu, 316 East 88th Street. I just had a question for the architect. Am I unmuted? Yes, we can hear you. Um, uh, what was what was the reasoning for the the uh, glass doors or the framed glass doors? Are there for the matching properties? Are they solid doors everywhere else? Uh, am I on mute or am I on? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, well, incidentally, at uh, one nineteen east seventy eight. Um, we know from precedent from the 1937 renovation, it's this townhouse on this side here, that in the rear, it was typical of uh, townhouses of this age to have large steel windows. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a photo with me of the rear of this townhouse, which is historic also. So we're taking inspiration from the 1930s through the 1940s for you know, uh, where New York City went from neoclassical to modern. And often the facades remain neoclassical and the rear were opened up for, for more light and air. And ultimately that's what this owner would like, more light and air to enjoy their garden from the inside uh, since they have some green space. This is on the primary facade though, yes? Uh, no, the, the big windows are in the rear. So they're not visible from anywhere. I, I, I'm referring to your, your basement level primary facade main entry doors. Oh, I see. Sorry. Um, so those doors here, which are in the sunken area way. Um, yes. And again, because the basement level is, is uh, three feet under the level of the sidewalk, the ground floor is quite dark. And this was the only way to get light into the ground floor from, from the front, from the street. Is that a typical feature or is that gonna be atypical? Yes. It's a typical feature. Um, and it's this way, it's hard to see, uh, but on 110 E78 Street, which is a historic facade sister building, all of those openings have glass in them. So it is typical of these buildings of this age, but also of the three buildings that were built at the same time for the same family. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else from the public? Okay, we'll go to the committee. <clears throat> David, would you like to go in alphabetical order by the vote sheet and just let's, let everyone speak? I think that's the simplest way to do it, alphabetical by the vote sheet. 
All right, first person would be Elizabeth Ashby. You're gonna be unmuted. Okay, so if this is uh, the facade uh, treatment is uh, the color of the uh, facade is it, is the same as it was in the 1930s? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's I'm fine with the, that. Thank you. And next up will be Gail Barron. Yeah, hi. I have a question. Um, you're going to expand a little onto the street toward the existing tree pit. And yes. uh, where are you currently as far as taking a public sidewalk versus where you uh, would hope to be? Existing right now, as you see, the existing fence here is mm -hmm. eight foot five feet away from the tree pit. Okay. Um, and what you see beyond here is the granite wall of 875 Park. And so we are, we are proposing to take the fence up to the front to align with the 875 granite wall, which would set all of our clearances the same as 875 Park. Which was what dimension again, if you could share that? Um, the new ones or the existing ones? The new. New. Uh, so the, the area way would extend um, eight foot two out from the face of the townhouse, which is set back from the property line. And then the clearance from the fence to the tree pit, it's six foot two. Thank you. <clears throat> Up next is Michelle. Michelle, you're unmuted. Okay, thank you. Uh, two questions. What's the height of the fence? The fence is three foot three. And is that on top of any wall or is that the total to the sidewalk? It's the total to the sidewalk. Okay. And also, can you just tell us a little bit about the lighting fixtures that you're proposing? Um, well, I wish I could, but the client hasn't chosen them yet. Uh, we're still debating whether to do gas lights or electric lights, but they would really like to have old fashioned gas lights uh, if we can put them in. We know they're allowed by code. It's just a matter of uh, long-term maintenance, whether it would be you know, easy to look after, look uh, over the long-term, but we would love to have a live flame. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Sure. Up next, up next is Alita. Thank you. I have trouble with encroaching on the sidewalk, irrespective of the adjoining properties. It just is gives me the feeling of a, of a building building a moat and protecting itself from the riffraff on the streets. Um, as the city is more congested, and I say this all the time, so forgive me for being redundant, as the city gets more congested and there are more people, and people with strollers and walkers and wheelchairs and dogs and multiple dogs and toddlers. And um, it to so distancing distance, it's not really that far. It's far for social distancing, but not really for encroaching on the sidewalk. I do like the rest of, I do like the rest of um, what you're doing with the facade. I have something with that. I should also say I'm to that building, if it's the building I'm thinking of where there was pediatrician i've been to that building a number of times so yeah. it's an attractive yeah it's a, it will look that i'm sure very attractive with your changes thank you sarah's next thank you sarah okay um i i would piggyback on to alita's comments i think that the, uh, the work on the facade has been um, really thoughtful and I am, um, it, it's really nice to hear that the applicant is interested in restoring the building to, um, to something that reflects its history. Um, and, uh, but I also have the same concern um, with regard to the, um, the extension into the sidewalk. 
Um, Anthony? Uh, I, I don't have any problems with this. Uh, normally, I would be apprehensive about the uh, reduction of the sidewalk, but here I think it's, um, since it is in fact aligning with the uh, Park Avenue building, I don't see a problem here. Marco. Um, oh, thank you. Um, well, I found it that the whole application is very sensitive. The front facade makes a lot of sense. The rear uh, part is also a very good approach. And yeah, my concern is all obviously in the airway, especially in the, the increase of the encroachment. Um, I think I, I found it a little bit intrusive. They lose two feet. It's true that you try to align with the, other, with the corner building, but I believe that it's better to have uh, the three buildings probably in the same alignment rather to have, because there are three buildings, there are, are actually the three of them are sisters and it should align not with the corner building, it should be aligned with the three buildings. That makes more sense rather to align with the uh, building, with the corner building. With this building? Yeah, if it's, if it's uh, not with the corner, you had to align just only with the uh, uh, 106, 108, and 110. Whatever it is, I think I, it will be fine. I see. What's this the dimension is, at 110? Yeah, this is mislabeled. I'm sorry. This is 110 here. I'm it's sorry. area way. This is 108. It's area way. And this is 106. This is a mislabeled um, note on the drawing. Sorry. Okay. Is Christina here? She is. She's unmuted. Who are you calling? Christina. Christina. This is Christina. <clears throat> Sorry. I don't have any questions and I'm in favor of this application. Kimberly? <clears throat> Kimberly? Hi, um, overall I'm in favor of this application. I really appreciate the effort to bring the building in keeping with the 1930s facade. And I'm okay with the work to the rear facade, but uh, Alita and Sarah's points about the sidewalk are very valid and I agree with them completely. Um, I'm anxious to hear how the rest of the committee votes. Jane, anything? Uh, you know, it's two feet into the sidewalk. How, what is the... Um, measurement the dimension for the extension into the sidewalk the front area way i'm pulling that up again um so the existing um fence right now is eight feet away from the at the the farthest is eight feet away from the tree pit and proposed would be six foot two away from the tree pit so one foot eight different I'm wondering, um, David, when we come to a vote, if we could do this in two parts and do the front area way separately. The rest of the project is utterly beautiful. I have no issue with it, but I don't like creeping into public space myself. <clears throat> I think it's a good suggestion. So <clears throat> does anybody want to make a resolution? Let's make a resolution for the building itself, and then we'll make a resolution for the area way. Jane, why don't you make the resolution? Oh, okay. I'll make a move to approve the, um, the front and rear elevation work as proposed. I need a second. Michelle has her hand up. Okay. Okay. So Michelle. Let's... Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So I'll second it. And then with the Area way uh, would be the second part of this, correct? Yes. Area way is a separate yes. resolution. Correct. So the I second. Okay. That's how we call the roll. <clears throat> Ashby. Oh, one second. Elizabeth. Yes. Hello. Yes, we, we heard you and we'll uh, put you down 
as a yes. Give me one second. I'll get the vote sheet back up. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, we have you down as a yes. And the Baron. Yes. Yes. Next would be Burnbaum. Yes. Great. Next would be Camp. Camp. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, next would be Chu. Give me one second. Sarah? Yes. Next would be Cohen. Give me one second. Anthony? Yes. Yes. Uh, Helper? Yes. Yes. Um, Tamayo, give me one second. Marco? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, Marco, Christina? Yes. And then uh, Selway? Yes. yes. We need a resolution for the areaway. A move to disapprove is present um, the extension into the public way, the areaway extension into the public way. We need a second. Um, Michelle has her hand raised. Michelle. Michelle. Second. So let's call the roll. Okay. A yes is a disapproval. Elizabeth, are you still unmuted? Uh, abstain. Okay. Yeah, Mrs. Barron? Yes. Michelle. Yes. Alita. Yes. Sarah. I think she muted herself again. <clears throat> yes. Anthony. Uh, no. David, yes. Jane? Yes. Marco? Yes. Yes. Christina? Yes. Marco, we got you. Christina? Yes. Kimberly? Um, Kimberly? Kimberly? Yes. Okay. And we thank you for a beautiful presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move right along to the next application. 34, 30, 60, 70th street. I'm going to mute everybody again, and then we'll unmute the architect and everyone from that application. Okay. Kaz, uh, uh, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, Jose Ramirez, um, you're unmuted. Um, Justin and Lakin. Um, one second. Lakin, are you all? Thank you, Will. Thank you. Yes, thank you. 
And then, well, this is like, and I'm going to share my screen if that's yes, okay. You, yes. There okay. you go. You. This is 3436 East 70th Street. J.L. Ramirez, the architect, presenting. This is a complicated application. Modify the front elevation, the areaway and railings, extend the brick rear elevation, modify the rear yard, and construct rooftop additions. And I believe there's somebody there from Quiggins and um, Quiggins. Higgins yes. and Quiggins. Yes. That's okay, so try to be succinct as possible. Just remember, we love measurements. <laughs> and I did look at the pre-submission materials behind the paint on the front elevation. What is the material? Just uh, and then we can get started. So the, the underlying material underneath the paint is a combination of um, stucco and cast stone. Uh, okay. And then the substrate is brownstone in very poor condition. Okay. Great. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. No problem. No problem. So this is uh, Cass Stackelberg from Higgins, Grace, Barth and Partners. Um, I want to first off just actually thank the committee for holding this meeting because as you all know, with, without the opportunity to do this, we can't continue with the public review process. And I know this um, you know, requires some flexibility on the committee's part. So we, we on, the, on the side of the applicant and applicants uh, very much appreciate you all um, taking on this new format. Um, before, um, before I begin, I also want to mention that we are calendared for a public hearing uh, at the Landmarks Commission on uh, April 28th, so a week from tomorrow. Um, I think you all are having your full board meeting this week, so um, if, if possible, you could forward a resolution after that to Landmarks, we would, uh, we'd appreciate that. Um, so um, as, as stated, the, the project address is 3436 East 70th Street. It's um, actually, historically, two row houses that were combined in the 1920s. You can see it on the left. Uh, it's located um, on the south side of 70th Street in the Upper East Side Historic District uh, between Park and Madison. Um, next slide. Um, the project um, involves, uh, uh, as stated, a few, a few uh, different areas of work. Um, currently, the building is a multifamily dwelling. It was originally constructed as a single family. Um, so the proposal is to return it back to a single family uh, use. Um, and in the process, the proposal involves reconstructing the front facade uh, to match the configuration and detailing, but in, in new material. And part of that, as you'll see in the presentation, is, is really not just um, warranted, but it's really necessary given the condition of the underlying facade material. Um, there are elements on the roof. Um, when we filed the application, we weren't certain about its visibility, so that was referenced in the application material. Those elements on the roof are not visible, so we, we really don't have any information um, to share because it's all being handled at staff level. And then obviously the other piece of the scope of work is at the rear elevation, and Jose Ramirez uh, from Jose Ramirez Architects will take you through the design presentation, but we do want to give you a bit of introduction just to understand um, how these buildings came to be, both in terms of their original design in the 1920s and their current condition, which uh, is quite significant in considering the application. Uh, next slide. So the, the photo at the center um, shows the original uh, four row houses uh, between 34 and 40 East 70th Street. Uh, these were originally brownstone fronted row houses built in the 1880s. The map on the left shows these four um, houses. There's roughly an A, B, B, A pattern. And what you'll notice in the uh, map is that on the left, which is 34, uh, that's a 21 foot row house. And then you had 21 foot, 16 foot, 16 foot, and 21 foot row houses. And that's um, the grouping that you can see in the photo on the center. Um, the photo on the far right, um, which was actually um, a, a, an image of the, the more grand limestone front of the building um, on the right side of that photo. But the photo on the right shows 34 East 70th Street in 1914. And you can see it was a fairly typical uh, late 1880s neo grec brownstone fronted uh, row house. Uh, in 1924, uh, next slide. In 1924, um, 34 East 70th Street was purchased by James Warburg, who then retained the architect William Bottomley to redesign the front facade of that house. And so the photo at the center shows the reconstructed front facade of 34 East 70th Street. And that was completed in 1925. You can see the map on the upper left um, highlights just that single 
that single building, the 21 foot wide building at 34. In 1929, um, Warburg went on and actually purchased the adjacent building at 36 East 70th Street. You can see that highlighted on the map on the bottom left. Um, and the tax photo on the right now shows the buildings as they were completed soon after in 1929. It's about 10 years after. So you can see the full width of these two buildings. So originally, just to sort of step back, originally only 34 East 79th Street was reconstructed uh, in what the Landmarks Commission's designation report refers to as a um, neo-medieval style. Um, and you can see the remaining brownstone fronted row house uh, at the center uh, at 34. And then those two buildings um, were combined internally into a larger single family home in 1929. You can see that in the tax photo. Next slide. Um, in 1925, there's an article published in Arts and Decoration magazine. And what's interesting is that um, there's a reference, you can perhaps read it on the, on the top of the slide. To those who know Spain, this delightful New York home recalls an old Spanish palace in Palma de Mallorca. And so Bottomley, William Bottomley's references for the front of uh, these, uh, these buildings was, was this um, palace in, in um, Palma de Mallorca. You can see a photo of it on the right. And we found it particularly interesting to, to look at this because you can see these pointed Florentine arches that are used across the fifth floor of the 70th Street row houses, but also this mix of smooth and rough stone, this light colored um, limestone and sandstone in, uh, in this uh, very grand residence. But we thought it was interesting to see this as his reference point uh, for the reconstruction of those two facades on, on 70th Street. Next slide. Um, also looking at some other buildings of Bottomley's in the Upper East Side Historic District, three other uh, limestone fronted facades uh, that he did. Um, again, con, um, reconstructed facades, as is almost the tradition in the Upper East Side, um, taking 1860s, 70s, 80s row houses, typically fronted in brownstone and re refacing them in limestone. So these buildings on 74th, 68th, and 71st Street are other bottomly designed buildings with limestone fronted uh, facades in the district. Um, next slide. Uh, returning back to 70th Street, so a few um, recent uh, photos of the uh, of the building, and I think what is very significant about our proposal is is the condition of the underlying facade. Um, while it looks fairly um, tidy uh, on closer inspection, um, let's go to the next slide. Um, you can see that the building um, really over time has been slowly degrading. So these the photos from 1914. 1944, and then the 1980s tax photo. What's interesting is that to achieve this medieval, neo-medieval um, treatment, what Bottomley did was he um, had, uh, had his uh, designers um, hammer the brownstone, literally, um, to give it a sort of weathered and, and um, uh, historic look to it. Um, brownstone on its own is already a quite porous material. And by hammering the ashlar brownstone that you see on the far left, um, what that did beginning in the 1920s um, just allowed for more um, deterioration to an already porous building material. So by the 1980s, you can see the photo on the right, in addition to the soiling and streaking across the lighter units, you can see that the entire brownstone facade was starting to basically peel off and just uh, crumble. And, and uh, we've been working with Mary Jablonski, who some or all of you may know, she's an architectural conservator. She's done a series of um, investigative probes to look at what the facade uh, composition is and its condition. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about that as we get into some of these detailed photos. Next slide. Um, some detailed photos from 1944, a, a high resolution photo. And you can see, particularly in the photo on the, on the right, number three, um, in the 1920s, as I said, the brownstone was hammered to give it this sort of weathered look. And there was an alternating pattern between a smooth stucco, which you can see highlighting the, the enframements around the windows and in between the shutters, uh, up on the top floor, on the fifth floor of this arcade. Um, there was a combination of stucco and these Florentine arches, but those pilasters were actually done in cast stone. So there was this idea of sort of alternating between smooth finished areas and then this hammered finished area. And the photo on the top right, number two, you can see by 1944, 
the brownstone was already uh, delaminated. And you can see that in other areas uh, around the facade. Next slide. Uh, returning now to, to present day, and what we have today is the remains of the underlying brownstone, but the entire facade has been um, coated in a, a very heavy elastomeric uh, painted coating, but it's also in many areas been stuccoed and parged. And so what you have is a series of um, finishes on the original brownstone coatings uh, that have been trapping water since the 19... 40s, um, and then more recently since these coatings have been applied, um, that have caused the underlying brownstone to completely degrade. So the brownstone in looking at, at probes is, is completely friable, which means it just crumbles, uh, and there's significant surface loss. So Lakin, perhaps you can zoom in on the upper, uh, upper left photo, uh, upper left of the photo, just so everybody can see. Um, I don't know if we can do this, but you can see on the upper portion on the right side, it's hammered. On the left side, it's all been parged and it's smooth. This is above the, uh, the arches on the fifth floor. Um, so you see this separate line because you've got two different treatments. And then below the sill course on the fifth floor, you can see how the brownstone has been delaminating and now is also coated uh, with an elastomeric coating that is only uh, furthering the deterioration by holding water uh, into the stone. So the underlying facade material of this building uh, is is really crumbling. And so they're really, um, you know, other than just continuing to smear the facade with stucco, um, you know, our client who has purchased this house and is intending to raise a family there, um, he's looking to to make a, a, a significant intervention and, and an improvement to the building and its longevity. Uh, and as Jose will, will share with you, sort of replacing the front facade in, in stone um, and, and true natural stone. Um, next slide. Um, some details, just sort of comparing from the 1940s to present day, sort of how many of the areas of the facade have been coated. Um, as I said, it's just a continuation of the degradation of the underlying material. Next slide. Um, also, looking at sort of precedent within the district, we thought this example um, was particularly relevant. This is a, a bottomly designed, um, a redesigned front facade. So on the left, this is 132 East 92nd Street originally built as an 1880, uh, 1880s uh, pair of uh, buildings, row houses. Um, in the 1930s, bottomly mm -hmm. um, refaced that building um, in stucco, um, which in turn then degraded. And, and in 2005, <clears throat> 2006 rather, um, the Landmarks Commission approved the replacement of that light stucco facade uh, with a limestone facade as a sort of more durable, long lasting uh, material replicating the same detailing that was incorporated in, in Bottomley's design. And we're, we're looking to do something quite similar uh, in our proposal. Uh, next slide. Um, a few other existing condition photos. Um, part of the proposal, as you'll see, is to create a small areaway because one of the challenges, and you can see that's, that's me for scale, uh, standing in the doorway um, in the building, I'm six foot, six foot one. You can see that the one of the, the 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 front door, the main doorway into this building, is only about six and a half feet tall. So one of the um, efforts that we'd like to to make is to actually create a sort of more generous um, door height. So by lowering and creating an areaway, which you can see on the upper left uh, photo, um, our areaway will sit well within um, the stoop uh, to the east and to the west. It doesn't project out very far. Uh, but it will allow the doors uh, to be sort of more appropriately scaled. We'll obviously be retaining uh, the ironwork that you can see across the ground floor of the building. I'll also point out in the photo on the lower right, what's interesting is that the lower portion of the facade below that grating, which is a, an opening down into the basement, even that um, was finished in stucco. So the idea of sort of lowering this facade actually is perhaps in keeping with some of the ideas the bottomly had as he was thinking about how to finish the bottom uh, portion of the front facade. Next slide. Um, turning to the rear of the building, um, a fairly uh, pedestrian uh, elevation on the upper floors, um, common brick, um, lintels and, uh, and sills, and a combination of uh, replacement windows and some uh, historic double hung, uh, double hung windows. 
Um, the photo on the right just shows the base of an extension um, at the back of 36. Uh, and then to the left of that, uh, the extension off the back of 34. We're looking to reconfigure and actually lower the height of those, uh, those extensions. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then a few other photos um, just illustrating the conditions at the lower portion of those extensions. There's a key plan on the right side of the slide. You can see these are the sort of back um, open rear um, portions of the yard. So um, some simple detailing, a metal um, fire escape balcony off the back, uh, and then portions of the, um, of the rear of 36 have been parged uh, and, and painted. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then returning to the front facade for Jose uh, Ramirez's uh, portion of the presentation. Thank you, Cass. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board. Uh, thank you for hosting us this evening. I'd like to walk you through um, the uh, renovation to 34, 36, 30, 34, 36 East 70th. Our, our design intent is to uh, restore the building, converting the existing eight uh, family apartment building into a single family home. Um, as Cass said, the building is classified in neo-medieval neo style, um, designed by uh, Charles, uh, by uh, Graham and Sons in 19, 1885 and restored by William Bottomley in 1924 through 1929. As Cass mentioned, the building is in very poor condition. The stucco finish and brownstone substrate uh, done in the 80s has deteriorated and the windows need to be replaced. Um, in reviewing the facade, again, our goal is to um, uh, uh, maintain the existing character of the building and um, replace the um, stucco uh, of the, um, the brownstone that was stuccoed over with Italian limestone. And if you go to the next slide, you'll, you'll, you'll see the material on the left is, will be for the window trims um, and, and cornice details. And the material on the right will be a mixture of, it's a bush hammered Italian limestone, parts of it will be bush hammered, and part of it will be sandblasted to try to replicate the character, the, the modeled character of the existing building. Can you go back one more please, Lennon? So as you can see, um, we will try to replicate the detail and we'll have the model effect throughout the facade. Uh, starting with the roof, we will replace the, um, the Spanish tile in kind the, um, the fifth floor arched windows will be all, and blind arches will all remain and will be replaced in kind. And the arches and pilasters will be replaced with the Italian limestone. Um, all the window openings and masonry substrate, which is about um, three whites thick of brick will also remain with the uh, new um, rusticated hammered and um, sandblasted facade. The, um, the third floor balcony will, will remain in its location with the existing railing and the railing will just be restored. We will sand, scrape and paint and, re, and uh, uh, maintain the existing railing. The cornice below will be replaced with, with the Italian limestone in the lighter finish. Moving to the second floor, um, there's an existing horizontal railing that you can see on the left. We will remove that railing and and replace it with Juliet balconies with a railing design that will match the um, existing designs on the on the existing building. And that will be new in the, inserted into the uh, in, into the uh, Juliet balconies, and the doors will be replaced in kind. On the ground floor, as Cass mentioned, we will have an areaway that you will step down with a railing in front, and that railing will be about 42 inches high. Um, you will step down a few steps. Um, it's important to note that this area way is actually within our property line, so it's not impinging upon the right of way at all. We have about three foot ten of space uh, from our front property line to the building facade, and this area way, area way will be within our property. Um, the the existing uh, window gratings will also be um, retained. They will be scraped, painted, and restored. And we will extend the bottoms of the, of the gratings with a design that will be reviewed by Landmarks to, um, to encompass the, uh, the longer windows into the area way. The only major change to the facade, as Cass mentioned, will be um, replacing the 
stuccoed over uh, um, brownstone that's in very poor condition with Italian limestone in the bush hammered um, uh, effect and sandblasted effect to give the, the, the facade the original character that Bottomley intended with the, um, that modeled effect throughout. And again, mo all the openings and arches and roof will remain um, as they are replaced in kind. Now, if we move to the next slide, you can, there you see the finishes, the, the, uh, bot, the um, upper left hand corner, again, will be all the window trims, cornice and detailing, the sills, and the two on the right will be the a mix of hammered and sandblasted uh, limestone to get to, to re try to replicate that, that um, model defect. Move into the next slide. There you see the elevations of the building existing on the left, new proposed on the right. Um, next slide. The rear of the building. Okay, the rear of the building, um, we are extending the rear portion of the building to the required 30 foot setback. Presently, there's an extension on the building that's existing non-conforming, which is the bottom left-hand corner. That Could you extension go that again? as it stands today, could you just backtrack again and start over again with the rear elevation? Sorry. Okay. The, the existing, as you see in the slide, on the left, you have the existing building. The portion on the bottom left-hand corner is an existing non-conforming section of the building, two-story existing non-conforming section. Um, on, the, on the right, you have the, the proposed extension, which will go to the 30-foot setback, maintaining the bottom uh, left uh, left hand corner will be reduced to a one story extension even though the owner even though we're extending the back of the building we will reduce the nonconformity of the extension to one story versus two story being noting the fact that we are moving uh, and extending the building back the building will be re, re uh, extended to the 30 foot setback The materials on the rear of the building will be similar to what, what is there now with the brick, um, limestone headers on the windows, and some of the cornice detailing and parapet detailing that's, that's in the existing portion of the building. You'll see it on the, on the back section by the on, the, on the right side, you have the curved parapet, and we'll introduce that, even though we don't have as many parapets as there are presently, we will uh, reintroduce some of those details. The existing non-conforming section will be clad in the same Italian limestone as the facade, replicating some of the, the pointed arches and a pilaster similar to the fifth floor um, design, to the fifth floor of the, uh, of the existing building. So the, the intent in the back is to um, try to keep and maintain some of the character of the building, uh, but it is being extended to the 30 foot setback. Uh, could we just go back for? Sorry, I'm so confused. Let's not go to the roof yet. Sure. On the when I'm looking at it, the existing is on the left. The new, proposed is on the right. How yes. many square feet? It's you said you're removing something to just have the one story. You're reducing the nonconformity of the extension. What exactly does that mean? That means that the extension has two stories on it. Um, oh. that, that's the lower level, and then the, that's the upper level. We're removing the upper level of, of the, oh. ex, the extension and bringing oh. that down to a one-story extension, not two stories. So you're removing the As top story. As you see on the, on the right. One story. We're removing the top story. Yes, we're removing but one at story. At the same time, you are extending it out to the rear property line. Is that correct? Yes. No. Yes, we are. Yeah. The one story is being extended no, out, the, right? No. No, 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 no. The one story okay. is existing non-conforming and it, it, it is staying in its present location. The, okay. the brick facade of the building, the brick facade is being extended to the 30 foot setback, only the brick facade. The, the upper uh, floor. Okay. Yeah. okay. So can I just uh, maybe point this out? So on the, on the, on the existing elevation on the left, uh, there's a silver flue and then two windows. Perhaps Lake and you can highlight that flue. That's a, I think, yeah, a, a yeah, flue. I right. And that, that's tied to our building. That's part of 34. 
that's going to be eliminated and the rear facade is going to be reconstructed out to about the, the line of that flue. So you can see on the slide on the, uh, the image on the right, um, the facade is pulled out and then you can see those two windows. Okay, let's see, how many square feet are you adding? How many square feet are you adding? Okay. If you're um, pulling out that facade, just important to know that this has been reviewed by the built by uh, the building department and we have re received zoning approval for this building. No, that's fine. I just want to know how many square feet are going to that pulled out facade is going to consist of how many square feet? I can answer that for you. Uh, Justin Price from Ramirez Architects. Thanks. Um, we are extending about 430, squ 430 square feet per level at for three levels. That all equates to about 1,200 square feet. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. Jose and Justin, this might be clarified in the sections. Would you like me to skip yes. ahead? Sure. Yes, please skip ahead to that section that shows the, the bulk. The next one. Keep going one more. That one. If you could zoom in, uh, Latin, Latin into the back of the building. If you see, you'll see the heavy dash line is the existing building. Scroll down a little bit. The heavy dash line is the existing building, and you could see where we're extending and removing. So where the arches are on the bottom right-hand corner, you could see we've removed the heavy dash line, which is the upper part of that one story. And then as you trace along the back of the building, you'll see the extension uh, along the back of the building. The heavy okay. dash line is the, the existing condition. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I'd like to move on to the roof. On the roof, in fact, this actually is important. To, you can leave it on that section, Lacken. Please go back. Uh, I thought made the more. roof. Um, the work at the roof was approved at the staff level. It will be yes. It's, yes, it it's will. Not, it's, not it's not. It's not visible. It's not visible. It's not visible. The roof just composes of a bulkhead and a small extension in the rear, and it's not visible. Okay, and it's all been approved. It's, the zoning on this building has been approved. I understand that, but I thought you said the additions at the roof were approved at the staff level. Uh, the, the work on the roof um, will be approved at the staff level as part of this filing. Um, they The staff has reviewed it. They've been on the roof with us and they say it meets their rules. So we, we haven't filed it separately, but they've confirmed that it, it can be approved at staff level. Very good. So. We don't. We are just going to vote on the work at the front and the work at the rear, not the work on the roof. Is that correct? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Correct. Yes, please. Okay. That concludes my um, my presentation. Thank so you have, so much. We have four um, things, and then yeah. So I, if I could just make one final point, I'm sorry. Sure, so, go ahead. Um, I think one of the things that we've been careful to do, particularly with the front facade, is to maintain the, the sort of organization of the historic. So one of the things you'll see is that the front facade is not symmetrical, and that really owes uh, is owed to the, the uh, varying widths of these two buildings that were combined in the 1920s, the 21 foot wide to the right and the 16 foot to the, uh, to the, to the east. And then that blind arch on the fifth floor is actually the bearing wall that separates the two buildings. So while we are replacing the material, uh, we're replacing it in a material that Bottomley used um, frequently in his buildings on the Upper East Side and was even looking to in this um, Spanish um, precedent. But I think for us, what's also very important is to maintain the organization and the ironwork of that front facade so that the feeling of the building and its sort of neo-medieval character uh, is retained, although obviously in, in new material. Thank you very much. And that material cast will allow, well, I'm sorry, and that material allows also to create a better uh, uh, facing for the building that will last uh, longer than the current materials. Well, it's interesting. Thank you for pointing out the detail about the blind arch. Yep. Um, it's a touch of whimsy, which is so appreciated. Um, even though I know you couldn't put a window behind it anyway. So is anybody from the public there who wants to speak to this application? 
Well, I, Zoom meetings aren't meant for the public really in a funny way. Okay, we're gonna go to the committee and Will, if we could just go alphabetically from the vote sheet. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the first person up for speaking will be Elizabeth Ashby. I'm gonna unmute you, Elizabeth. Uh, I think it's a most attractive change. Uh, however, I'm not so sure it's in line with but entirely with but what the materials in particular that Bottomley had in mind. Uh, so um, I'm, I haven't made up my mind yet whether I will approve it. Um, but that is, uh, uh, I think you have a, a, a very attractive uh, facade there, uh, and I have, uh, I think the rear facade is fine as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I don't know whether I'm in the position where I'm going to have to support something I like less, uh, because it was the original intent of the architect. That's me. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next up is Gail Barron. I think that the overall uh, addressing of the um, deterioration issues has been really very thoughtful, well done, and you've done, to my eye, uh, an excellent job, and I can certainly support it. Next up is Michelle. Yeah, can you tell me if the um, are the the windows that you'll be replacing are they going to be wood? Yes, the front the windows on the front and the back the front will be wood. Yes, yes, the windows will be wood. And in the rear, the windows in the rear will actually be uh, metal clad wood windows, but they will be have the same historic ca character. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the mechanicals? Uh, we're going through a whole mechanical design process right now. It will be a standard um, residential uh, heating system. Because what I'm looking at, if I'm looking at the existing facade and the proposed, it seems that you're expanding the mechanicals at the top of the, you know, on the roof. Well, uh, we're providing and that they're clad in something. That's not an addition, correct? No, no, no. Uh, that's the, the bulkhead up on the roof for the stair, and so it's brick clad. The the mechanicals are actually um, behind that uh, to the um, to the south, and none of that is visible. We built a mock up of of that element, so you can see uh, the street is um, uh, to the where are we here? Sorry, to the, right. uh, yeah, to the Can market. you go back to the preceding slide? Jane, are we supposed yeah, to be that talking one. about the roof? We're not voting on the roof. Well, that was actually my, my question. You know, I know that lots of things are going to staff mm -hmm. level. And some of the stuff that had been treated at staff, we had been very disappointed with, but we have not had the opportunity to comment. In this situation, even though the roof is going to staff, since the rest of the application is with us, I think we would be remiss in not commenting on the roof. The fact that it's going to staff does not permit to forbid us from commenting. So I think it's worth our attention to know what it is, how much it's being expanded, um, and what the setback is, because it looks much larger in this particular picture. The proposed looks much larger than the existing. So I think we should take our opportunity uh, to comment on it. So with that having been said, is it brick? Is that what the, you the, said? The bulkhead will be for the elevator and the stair, and it will be clad in brick, yes. And what's the dimension of it? Justin, do you have the dimensions, please? You zoom in on that lake. You zoom in on that. On the bottom. Um, <clears throat> the bulkhead, can you uh, go over to the right? The bulkhead is 40, 41 feet wide. A long front to back, 
and uh, I'm just trying to get a clear dimension, about 17, 17 and a half feet wide, east to west. North, south, 41 foot three, roughly, it's hard to see at this scale, but it's about uh, 17 and a half feet wide. And it's, and it's, Lacken, can, can you zoom into the front dimension? I can't see that dimension. Say that again. The, this, no, the, the, over on the right, there's a dimension of how far, how far back it's it is. About, from the, it's about 20, 20 feet back from the front of the building. 20 feet back. It's, it's tw 20 feet back from the back of the uh, parapet. And, and so it's how much larger than what's existing now? Was there no stairwell there before? Um, can you go over to the, uh, left, to the right, Kalaki? You can see the difference between the two in, in this, this image right here. It was a bulkhead between two buildings, uh, and uh, we've moved it over. We moved it over to the far right. So, so it's this, about, which is being circled, is shifting. Okay, so it's about twice what it what currently exists in terms of size and scale. Yeah. About twice the size. It's about twice the size, but most of the extension is towards the rear. The front okay. of it is is about the same size. Okay. Um, also, did I misunderstand it? Did you say that you will not have a rear yard? No, there's an existing rear yard that will be maintained. The same dimension, what exists there now? Approximately, yes. Okay, so even though you're bringing, um, you're, you're bringing the rear facade, uh, you're expanding it by a, a few feet. You're going to end up with 1,200 square feet if you add up all the three stories, but it doesn't encroach that much into the rear yard. Yes, because parts of the second, the second, the parts of the back of the building are set in, and we're just moving them towards the back. The okay. building goes in and out. The building goes in and out in the rear. All right. Uh, can you just pull up a picture of the rear facade? I just have a question about that window. There's a a window that I want to ask you about. Not a rendering, but an actual photo. Yeah, well, it's a rendering. Yeah, the preceding one. No, um, no go back. That shows the new back. The new backyard. It shows the new bay window. Go forward. The two, yeah. the two axons, Lakin. A PC4, please. A PC4. All right, just give me a... Yeah, there right is. here, right here. So can you describe that to me? What is that, iron or what, what is that? Where, on the, um, on the roof? On the proposed rear facade, that window with the third floor. Yeah, your marker's on it right oh. now, yes. Okay, that's, um, that's a, a copper clad bay window, which is, prevalent in the backs of a lot of historic buildings in the, um, in the Upper East Side Historic District. That is a copper clad bay window. But it looks like the glazing is horizontal glazing. Is that just the rendering or is that what it is? Looks like a street lamp. No, I think it's just a rendering, just a rendering. So it will have divided lights? Yes, it will. Okay. All right, and the copper cladding is, is that gonna be like a greenish or is it, it look, it's black in the picture, but. Um, we're, we're looking to use, because the, the, the windows in the back will be black, we're looking to use a lead coated copper, which will just turn dark, gray, very dark gray. It's hard to see at the scale, at that scale. Okay, but it'll be divided panes like the yes. rest of the facade. Okay, Yes, we'll have All the same right. character. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Will, who's next, Will? Sorry, I had myself muted. Next is Alita. <clears throat> Alita? I know, I had to accept your invitation to unmute myself. Okay, so I may be an outlier here, but the front facade to me looks 1920s. The new facade looks like Paris. I think Paris is a beautiful city, but it's not what the building looks like. Um, so I have some trouble with it. Right now it's distinctive. It seems to have a lot of character. 
even just the removal and turning into Juliet balconies that send floor, I don't know what you call it, terror that runs the line of the building. And so the, the concurring treatment of the long windows or doorway street floor, um, it just has a, a really different look. So I'm not comfortable with the, um, it's beautiful materials, no doubt about it. And the treatment of the uh, doing we did with the smooth and versus the bush, bush, black, bush ham, which I can't bush imagine hammered. is a bush. Yeah, I don't, mm -hmm. But it, um, is nice. It's just, it's not quite the same to me. So I have that trouble on the front. And I think back is okay once you accept what's going to look like a lot bulkier building up there but it, it is the back and it's in your property it's the front and just to confirm and the area way is totally within your property line yes we have three foot ten of setback at that point of the building it's totally okay. within the property line and it's how and it sits between the the side facade of the building on the west and then the staircase the the stoop to the building on on the east so it's totally contained and within our property. Okay, so it, it's what's important is that it's within your property. But even the roof line, because you are missing the contrast between the furnace and the contrasting color of the facade, it just has a much more modern, uh, streamlined look. So thank you. Yeah, the the, uh, the stone though will be one will be darker and one will be lighter. It's very difficult to replicate that in a rendering like this, but there there will be a color distinction between the two, and you will pick up some of that color distinction, even though it won't be as brown. And I think that that building was painted over, as Cass mentioned, uh, but you will get a distinction between the smooth lighter stone and the and the hammered and sandblasted darker stone. I could see it a little bit in entering, and I appreciate that it just it has a different, for me, feel to it. The one on the left feels, for some reason, very, very 1920s. I saw the auditorium at the um, Museo Dario that was painted with children's fairy tales from the 20s. That's what this feels. The, the other, the newer one is just different. But I'm interested in what my colleagues have to say. I, I happen to like that period very much and that feeling very much. Um, so this is different, but again, I'm interested in my colleagues, so thank you. Uh, the next would be Sarah. Oh. Hi. Did someone need to finish up first? No, you're on. Okay. Um, so I, I, I've been thinking about Elizabeth's point about voting for something that she likes the look of better rather than something that is more uh, reflective of the state that the building was in in the past. And um, I, uh, and so I, I'm struggling with that as well. And I think that that's what uh, Alita was also talking about. Oh, actually, I think Alita liked the look. Um, so. Of the of the original, um, I th I th I thought that this um, design was really playful and really um, clever. I like how the um, the different colored limestone will um, will uh, point to the design of the past, um, and if if it's darker than the rendering here, I think that will help enormously with um, the feeling that it's, um, it's a little modern. Um, I also like the treatment in the rear facade, uh, reducing that two-story extension to one story, and then the way that the one story was designed, it's, um, it, it gives a much more open feel and um, a more organized feel to that rear facade. Uh, the question that I had was about the second floor balconies on the front facade that Alita mentioned. So when I first looked at the renderings, I, I thought they were little Juliet balconies, but then when we saw the photo where Cass was standing in the doorway, and I think it was either that photo or the one after it, 
where you could see the slats underneath the balcony. So it looked like a fire escape almost. And I wanted to ask if that was original to the building, if it was added on later, um, or uh, these, it, it didn't um, look like it was in really great shape or that it was that aesthetically pleasing to me. And so like removing it to me um, gave uh, the building a much more finished look, but um, but I, I just was wondering um, where that second floor balcony came from. I'm happy to address that if that's if that's okay to uh, address at this moment. Just about the that route. That sure, route. go ahead. Okay, um, Lakin, can you actually go into the appendix? I think it's um, LPC um, eleven. Um, the railing. Um, that's there, uh, we think does date to the, to the, 19, 20, the late 1929 uh, modification. Um, is, Lakin, are you able to pull up the, uh, the presentation? Oh, great. Sorry, I think I dropped off for a second there. I'm gonna uh, the be able to... um, So the railing that, uh, that's there today, we think does date to the tw late twenties. However, um, it's been, it's lost much of its detailing um, over time. So. The photo on uh, on the left is a, and maybe we can zoom into this, um, shows this sort of alternating um, star and ball detail. Um, that black and white photo on the left, you can see, um, that's the third floor down one. Give us a second. So the advantage of the technology is that we can actually zoom into the photos, whereas we can't do that when we're presenting in person. So you can see this sort of alternating pattern if you scroll over to the existing railing, in addition to the ironwork, which, uh, which is open on the bottom, almost like a fire escape, and it's in very poor condition, much of the detailing has actually been lost. So there are a few of those um, balusters with the uh, diamond shape, but the, the detailing of the other elements and many of those, those elements actually have been replaced over time. So what we're proposing is actually to um, take this down and create Juliet but with the original detailing. So while we'll lose the, the, that projecting element, which compresses the first floor of the building, we will actually get back to the detailing that was there in those uh, historic photos that, that no longer exist. Sarah, does that answer your question? Sarah? She may have muted herself back. Um, let me, Sarah, you're unmuted. Yes, sorry, I'm trying to be a responsibly Zoom user and muting myself when I'm not speaking. Uh, okay. Yes, that was very helpful, thank you. Okay, let's move along, Will. Uh, next would be date. oh, Anthony said he is stepping out, his internet connection was not good enough, and okay. so I don't see him still, or I didn't see he came back. So then it would be David next. Um, I'll hold off uh, uh, and give you co-chair privilege. I will uh, wait until it goes for everybody else and then goes back to Jane. <clears throat> well, you, I originally saw the um, proposed new front elevation. I was a little bit horrified because it's such a dramatic change from the existing condition. But the more I've looked at and studied that new elevation with the different colors of the limestone, which I, Trust the applicant that it you don't really get the color differentiation that will be apparent once it's in place, the different textures on the different um, kinds of limestone. It's such an unusual house. And you know, Bottomley was a very, very famous architect. He designed the River House in New York, um, Tudor City Gardens. Of his 115 buildings, I think. I don't know, 15 are actually on the National Register of Historic Places. It's very impressive. So I want to hear now what David Halpern has to say. I don't mind the rear. I mean, I think the rear is fine. It's just the dramatic change from the original, um, from the existing condition. You know, I'm half a mind to vote for it. It's, a, it's just so totally amazing that an applicant is going to go to this effort. And I did do some research. We are hearing another um, Warburg application, the Jewish Museum tonight. This was originally Felix Warburg's nephew's house. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. and all related to the loaves and the shifts. It's a fascinating slice of New York social history. Anyway, I'd like to hear what David Halpern has to say. And I'll be happy, Jane, to do that. I thought Will, I think you and Will misunderstood me. The chairs always go last. Oh, okay. But I, I, I've, I understood, I'm sorry. Um, so then the next in line would be Marco. Um, so I'm gonna skip Jane. And we'll Sorry. come back to the we'll both of you. I, no, 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 you're great, you're great. Um, uh, Marco, you're unmuted. Ah, thank you. Uh, I think the rear facade, um, the idea of to put this bay window, I think that this is traditional, but it's a little bit less uh, attractive, I should say, than the, the bay window. Oh, because the the rear extension where you reduce one floor, I think is you make extraordinary in, in that section, which are create a big contrast in materials as well as in the design. I think is this is this part is is like antagonist between each other, but it fits, and I agree with that. But not the bay window. The bay window is like a, you throw it in the middle of somewhere. Uh, but the rest of the of the rear facade, I think, is perfectly fine. That is my comment in the rear. In the front, I think you maintain the characteristics of the Spanish architecture, which is basically is the roof or the fake roof, the, the arcades, and maintain the windows. It's true that you remove the 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 balcony on the first floor. It makes sense because the problem, your problem is the height of the, of the basement and that is where you sink and to make larger, um, a, a higher the entrance door and then you create your airway. I think it's very smart, very good move. And I think pretty much the whole application makes a lot of sense for me. Thank you. So after Marco is Christina. Christina, you're unmuted. I thought it was a very thorough, thoughtful presentation. Anything else, Christina? Uh, then moving on to Kim. Hi, thanks, Will. Thanks, Jane. Uh, let me start by saying I really appreciate to what Christina was just saying, how thorough the, the explanations were in this presentation and the research that went into it. Um, and thank you for teaching me something about the other bottom lay building on 92nd Street, which is closer to where I live. But um, overall, I'm in favor of this proposal, although normally I always agree with Alita. So now I'm not sure. Um, my one question, just to clarify something that Jane had actually asked earlier that I didn't follow the answer for. Did you say that that 1200 square feet, is that the just the addition or is it the size of what's being added minus the reduction in the second floor? It, it's the total, it's the total floor area. So it's the net change? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for clarifying. Um, yeah, overall, I'm in favor of this. I'm I'm anxious to see how everyone else votes and the other commentary. Thank you, Will. So, so back to David and Jane. Okay. Well, thank you. I already said my little spiel there. I'm anxious to hear what David has to say. I'll say my little piece. Uh, I, I think that it is thoroughly studied. Uh, I think that uh, very appreciative of the detail work, et cetera. I just think the premise was wrong. Uh, this looks like a sort of a ghostly remembrance of the original building with the brownstone. And I don't know if it was limestone or not, but uh, having the limestone base and then the uh, dark and light uh, makes it such a distinctive building uh, and such a memorable building. And then all of a sudden we get this pallid white building and I know that limestone can be very beautiful, but I really think that uh, this is a step away from the drama of the original building. And as far as the rear goes, <clears throat> I don't have a problem with the 
repeating the limestone base on the assumption that it was relating to the original and not to the proposed. Uh, and I have no problem with the bay window. You see bay windows set into rear yard uh, facades all the time. It's sort of a happening. Uh, and I think happenings are good things uh, if properly done. Uh, but I will not vote for the front facade. I really think it's a mistake to change the coloration of this building. I would have liked to have seen the original <clears throat> brought back. Anyway, my personal opinion. Thank you, David. I think that we have to divide it. On, I'm writing up this resolution, Will. I hope you get it by five tomorrow afternoon. But in any case, I think we have to divide it into two parts. One is the front elevation and two is the back elevation. Why don't we start with the back elevation because that it seems to me that'll be a move to approve. So does anyone want to um, formulate a resolution? Move to approve as presented on the rear elevation. Could we get a second on that? I see Kim and I see several uh, seconds that are raising their hand and waving. So instead of unmuting, I think we okay. can count those. So, um, so why don't you go to the roll call now, Will? Okay. Thank you. I I'm going to try something different. I'm going to unmute all of the board members at once so I don't have to keep going back and forth. So just I ask that you uh, respectfully keep uh, quiet for a second. <coughs> and, um, while we Okay. Um, so this is for and I'm going to turn away. So I'm sorry. So if you can't hear me say something. Uh, this is for the rear elevation for an approval. Elizabeth Ashby. Uh, could you just, sorry, the entire police department was outside my window as uh, you were making the resolution. What was the resolution for? for? This is an What's approval this resolution? of the rear facade, correct, David? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, to approve it? Yes. Yes. A yes is a yes. Yes. Oh, here, wait one second. I'm going to take the screen back and so I can put the um, the vote sheet up so everyone can see it. Okay, you should be able to see the vote sheet now. Um, yes. oh, Gail, did I not unmute you? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Michelle. Yes. Alita. Yes. <clears throat> Sarah Chu. Yes. Uh, Anthony left. David. Yes. Jane. Yes. Marco. Yes. Christina. Yes. And then Kim. Kim, I see a thumbs up. I'll count that. Um, so that is for the rear elevation. Now, my sense is on the um, front elevation, it's a move to disapprove because it's too much of a contrast with the um, original building, the original historic fabric, which I'm assuming. David, correct me if I'm wrong, the original fabric was actually brownstone, is that that's, correct? That's my understanding from what I heard oh. early on. Okay, thank you. So we're, does anybody want to formulate a resolution on the front elevation? Resolve to disapprove. So uh, is there a second? I was gonna say resolve to disapprove due to the uh, radical Second. change from Sorry. the original. Uh, the radical change from the original, David? Yes. Second. Okay, I think we can go to a roll call vote on this. All right. Um, a yes is a disapproval. A yes is a disapproval. Elizabeth, are you still unmuted? Uh, yes, I'm sorry to say yes. Uh, Gail Barron. You just convinced me, so I'm going to vote yes. Yes is a yes is a no. So, all right, Michelle, are you still unmuted? 
Uh, yeah, I'm unmuted. Uh, pass for the moment. Okay, Alita. Yes. Uh, Sarah. Um, no. Um, Anthony left. David. Yes. Mich uh, Jane. Yes. Uh, Marco, are you still no. unmuted? No. No. Okay. Uh, Christina. Yes. Yes. And then Kim. No. No. And then I had a pass for From Michelle. Michelle. No. No. So that is. CS for no. Pass. So, is that all to that application? Yeah. So David's going to handle the next one. Okay. I'm going to mute everyone again, and we'll get the applicant for the fourth item uh, unmuted. Park District, Walter B. Melvin Architects, Chateau-esque style individual landmark originally designed by Charles Pierpont H. Gilbert between 1906 and 1908 with an additional building built by Roach of Dinkaloo and Associates between 1988 and 1993. Application for a temporary exterior art installation on the Fifth Avenue on the second and third floors by artist Lawrence Weiner. Uh, somebody that I've unmuted from the British <laughs> Museum has a lot of noise in the background. They... So, so sign me up. <laughs> oh, shit. Cindy Kaplan, we can hear you. I'm going to mute you. Um, your colleagues can tell me when you're ready to get back in. So we have Ruth, uh, Bish, C Cindy, Kaplan will come back whenever Kelly, Taxter, um, Claudia Gould, um, and Ted Eaker. One second, I assume you're the only Ted. And Sergio. And just tell me whenever uh, Cindy is uh, able to join. She can chat me to get on. Great. Good evening. Um, we're very pleased to um, be returning uh, to the Landmarks uh, Committee of Community Board 8. Uh, we appreciated all of the feedback we received uh, when we met with you last on January 16th. Um, and um, I believe that tonight you will find that we took your concerns very, very much to heart in regard to the art project that we are proposing for installation on the facade of the Jewish Museum by the artist Lawrence Wiener. Um, one piece of news that I'd like to share is that we had um, applied to the Department of Buildings for a ZRD1 uh, zoning um, opinion. Um, that is, um, you know, would they allow this project um, given the fact that it uses text uh, which could be considered signage. And we were very gratified to learn uh, in February that they had gone ahead and approved our ZRD1 and ruled that the project could move forward. Um, so uh, that was a, a very good piece of news for us. Um, we've, um, you know, returned to the drawing board. Um, and I'd just like to walk you through again um, a little bit about, about the project. You're seeing obviously here on the left the facade of the Jewish Museum, in particular the south side um, of the building and the west side of the building. Um, if we turn next to the little black and white image um, that uh, is just to the right, um, which shows the building in the 1920s, I just want to remind everybody that this is the original um, mansion, the original facade on the south and west um, sides of the, uh, of the mansion. Um, and that it was um, in the 1960s, there was a um, addition, um, the Vera List wing that was built that was subsequently 
demolished um, in the um, late 1980s and made way for an expansion of the facade by um, Kevin Roach's firm. Um, so while the southwest corner of the building is original um, construction of the Warburg Mansion, the northwest side of the building is more recent construction that was completed in 1993. And our architects, um, Ted and um, Sergio, can speak to the different types of construction much more um, effectively and with much greater expertise than I can. Um, so what we are um, now proposing, um, if we can scroll down a little bit, Will, um, if you would, is um, to um, simply place um, the artwork on the west side of the facade. We have eliminated the south side of the, of the project. Hearing um, your concerns about the number of penetrations that it would take to anchor the brackets that would hold, um, hold the artwork. Um, I do want to um, remind everybody or show you a couple of precedents for installing this type of work. Um, one um, in particular on the far right side, another project by Lauren Sweener that was um, installed on the facade of the Whitney Museum, um, I believe in 2007. And um, also I want to show, um, this was at the recommendation actually of the Landmarks Preservation Commission to show an, a couple of precedents for the type of um, banner um, that would be used um, for, um, for, the, for the artwork itself. It would be printed on the same type of banner as was installed um, here, um, as you can see at the, um, I believe one is the New York Historical Society. Um, so there, and, and one at the Chinese American Museum. Um, so that there are precedents um, for installing on historic facades like ours, the same type of banner. Now these aren't artworks, they are, um, they're actually um, posters or banners um, for exhibitions that are on display in those museums. So I think ours takes a, uh, a certainly a more distinct purpose in terms of a work of art that has a very strong social message, one that we really, really believe in at this point in time. And I would say that given the situation that we all find ourselves in at the moment where um, many museums are wondering when they'll be able to reopen and when we'll be able to visit, you know, welcome visitors again to see works of art within our facilities, that the um, opportunity to install an outdoor work of art like this, a public work of art like this at a moment, um, in the moment that we're going through it right now, um, I think would be a really great um, thing for our community and for, for the city. So um, I'd like to turn now to our architects to talk in more detail about the way in which the project um, has addressed the concerns of the number of penetrations that would um, have um, been needed um, for our former proposal. And so that you can understand that we've really taken it to heart and modified it quite extensively. But Ted, um, Sergio, I'm gonna turn to you now, please. Um, t Ted, I, I wanted to briefly touch on, on one of the precedents before you move into the uh, installation details, um, particularly the uh, New York Historical Society uh, Museum, where you know they used uh, half inch an diameter anchor bolts into motor joints. And after uh, listening to some of the concerns uh, brought up during our last presentation, we've um, emulated that approach uh, using also half inch anchor bolts uh, to anchor into mortar joints of the historic uh, building. Um, and, and these particular installations, uh, they use roughly about 32 anchors and we're uh, using about 38 anchors into the historical uh, building. Um, and also the, the size of the banner is also very similar to our installation uh, with this one being uh, slightly longer at 125 feet by 24 feet high versus our 28 and a half feet high. Um, and with that, um, I wanted to hand it over to uh, Ted Ecker, our, our principal 
to talk a bit more about the uh, installation details. Ted, are you there? Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, adjust my volume. Um, so uh, just going back one uh, to the A200 drawing for a second, thanks. So uh, just I wanted to emphasize as Ruth had, had mentioned already, um, originally the proposal uh, for the banner was to completely cover the Fifth Avenue uh, facade to wrap around the corner and completely cover the full length of the 92nd Street facade at the original mansion. Um, mm. So in this A200 drawing, now you can see uh, all the way on the left is um, uh, the extent of the, the banner as it projects um, from the Fifth Avenue side and then the 92nd Street side is completely um, uncovered. Um, so, uh, you know, and that was, uh, as Ruth mentioned again, um, completely uh, in response to the concern of the, of the committee before for the number of anchorages into the original uh, limestone facade. Um, now on the uh, on the next slide. So there uh, you see on the left um, the extent of the banner uh, in uh, pink or purple. Um, the sort of gray, light gray image um, in the background is the extent of the addition. To the right of that is the original uh, mansion. Um, now just as a brief reminder. Um, the artwork is to be supported by a number of uh, steel tube brackets, which are welded to steel channels, which are then bolted to the facades at both the uh, mansion and the addition. The original mansion is constructed as a solid masonry building faced with eight inch uh, thick limestone uh, ashlars. The addition uh, in 1993 is clad with three inch thick limestone veneer panels um, that are supported by a series of steel shelf angles with a two inch airspace between the uh, cladding and the uh, concrete block backup. So very different types of construction. Now, since the last presentation, <laughs> excuse me, the brackets at the mansion have been redesigned so that all the anchor bolts are now going uh, into uh, mortar joints. Uh, which are similar, uh, my understanding is to uh, the uh, Historical Society's um, uh, banner projects. There will be no anchor bolts into the original um, limestone uh, ashlar body uh, at, the, uh, at the original mansion. Now, um, unfortunately, because of the cavity wall construction of the addition, those brackets could not be redesigned so there, anchors will be uh, into both the mortar joints as well as the, the body of the panel, uh, just as the original proposal was. Um, so there will be a total of 86 anchors spread across the, the addition and the mansion. Um, there will be 38 at the mansion and 48 at the addition. Previously, um, there were 158 anchors altogether. So by eliminating the 92nd Street facade, we've eliminated 72 anchors, all of which would have been into the, uh, the original mansion. Now, um, so on, on the right, uh, you can see the various types of, uh, of brackets. Um, the, the top uh, couple are for the addition um, the, the remaining ones are for the, for the mansion. And uh, you can see, especially number uh, five uh, has been expanded um, height-wise so that all of the uh, anchor points align with the, the, mason, the mortar joints. So then uh, on the next page, uh, 202, you can see the base repair scope for, this is uh, showing the repairs at the uh, original mansion. Um, all the anchors will be completely removed by core drilling around the anchor rods. Um, for the mansion, a one inch diameter or smaller, if we can do it, um, core drill uh, will be uh, provided. Then uh, once the anchor is removed, the um, hole will be filled with limestone restoration mortar. And once the patch is cured, 
the mortar joints will be restored by cutting along the joint lines and then the cut joint will be pointed to match the original uh, mortar. Um, at the addition, mm -hmm. uh, the base repair will be similar. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, uh, all the holes will again be, be patched with restoration mortar uh, and, and uh, these, uh, there will be mock-up samples presented to landmarks. Uh, mm. If the landmarks uh, is not uh, happy with those samples, the museum uh, is prepared to actually replace those three inch uh, veneer panels with new limestone uh, to match the existing. Um, so that's being uh, priced as, as an alternate. So uh, that will all be in place should that have to happen. And that's it. <clears throat> I'm still taking notes. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Is there anybody from the public who would like to comment? And just a reminder to raise your hand to comment from the public. It is in the participants menu. The participants menu is at the very bottom of your screen. It looks like a couple little people and has the number 26 next to it. Uh, there will be a button that says raise hand once you open that menu. Uh, or if you are on the phone, it is by hitting star nine. Uh, David uh, D. Wu has raised his hand. Mr. Wu, give us your name and address again, please. D. Wu, 316 East 88th Street. Um, I think the applicant should be uh, commended for reducing the number of brackets from uh, by 72, but this is a lot of work um, on a, for a temporary installation. And I think, you know, by eliminating the entire project, they could reduce all of the brackets this is a, uh, the precedents that they were shown for, for museums and industrial buildings. Um, this is a mansion turned museum and it seems like a lot of arts institutions are gonna be going up against famine years. I, I don't see the need for this proposal. Anyone else from the public? Uh, Lowe apparently would like to raise his hand but hasn't uh doesn't know how, so I'm gonna unmute him, if that's all right with you. Yes. Hello? Hey, great, great. Thank you, Will. Um, give us your name and-, and uh, My, my name is Lowe Vandervalk. I'm representing Car Carnegie Hill Neighbors. Okay, Lo, I didn't uh, catch it before, okay. Lowe Vandervalk. Yeah, no, I didn't say it before. Thank you for your, for your guidance. Um, <laughs> We uh, we've been we've we've been discussing this project and considering it, and we're we're act we're very troubled by it. Frankly, um, we know that there is the precedent of the um, the West Side, the uh, the uh, New York uh, Historical Society, and, and and but but we think that that mu that institution and museum and the Museum of Natural History, uh, they kind of form a museum campus over there. They're, in the case of the Jewish Museum, it's different. It, they're wedded within our community. They're part of our community. And, and you know, we walk by this, I mean, I happen to live in the, in the block, so uh, I experience it. But, uh, you know, we, we experience our museums as, as almost an integral part of our community. We think that these banners introduce an element uh, which is a, a bit outrageous, but it's meant to be, it, you know, it, it's meant to draw attention to itself. It can't be otherwise, but we think that, um, and, and that works on the West side with, with the New York uh, uh, Historical Society, uh, because there's, they're, they're really trying to make a big point. But if, if, this, if this is copied by other museums in Museum Mile and, and, and is repeated, then, uh, you know, then this will change. This will have an impact on our community. 
and and we we are concerned about that. We're concerned about the, the precedent. Um, so that is, and I do appreciate the fact that we that they took it out of the residential block. Um, uh, that was a bit of overkill. So it's it's good that there was there's now some restraint shown, but we're very concerned about how this how this will impact into the future. Then there's also um, a physical concern about wind. What's the impact of wind? Is it going to make noise during the day or at night? At night, especially when people want to sleep. Um, I live across from uh, Nightingale Bamford School. They have their flags and you can hear those flags flapping depending on the wind. But this is going to be a much more a much more exposed structure. I mean, the wind on, on Fifth Avenue can be horrendous coming over the reservoir. And so we're concerned about that. And we're concerned also that, you know, it, this could tug and pull and, and, and strain the brackets and chip away at the limestone. So it, 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 by no means it, are we out of the woods with not damaging the limestone, even though I, we appreciate the fact that they've sought a new way of putting in the holes. Um, then uh, um, yes, then the final final thing is this is going to last four months, hopefully. I mean, there can always be delays. To, the insulation might stay up longer, but but it it will be sort of a breath of relief when it's finally gone. I mean, I mean, you you would think that something like this should bring joy to a community, but we're not clear that that's going to be the impact. So. Uh, we have strong reservations and, and we feel we cannot support this. Thank you, Lo. Anyone else from the public? A uh, person named March has raised their hand. Uh, please give us your name and address. My name is March Chadwick and I live at 225 E74th Street. I attend museums um, frequently on, on this avenue. And uh, I commend the architects for, for a, a well-executed um, details, but I have some questions um, regarding a banner that faces a park that I think was approved by zoning. And I would like the architects to speak a little bit more about how something that is in violation of the zoning resolution and in violation, I think of, of what is a, a proper landmarks application. Uh, and I would, but I'm curious to know what the other agencies, particularly zoning said about this, if that could be expanded in support um, or, or not support of the uh, application. Thank you. May I address that? Uh, I was gonna, who was speaking? Um, so um, we, were advised by the Landmarks um, Preservation Commission to go to the Department of Buildings on the issue of signage. Um, they were very, very clear that they um, expected um, us to seek um, a zoning um, opinion. And we um, turned in our application um, early in January um, and I think made a very, very effective case to the DOB. And we were very gratified that they came back to us and approved um, the project. They said that it did um, not violate um, the ZRD1 zoning regulations. And they, um, they had full um, images of what the artwork was going to look like. Um, and in the end, um, they were really very supportive. I think they recognized the fact that this is not um, a sort of slippery slope of installing uh, commercial signage or any type of advertising signage on the front of our, our beautiful building. They recognize the power of the message that the artist was trying to communicate. Um, and um, we would have really um, been dead in the water um, with this project if they had not um, approved um, when they did. So um, the fact that they did has, uh, you know, we felt very, very gratified. Um, I'd also like to just ask if um, we could turn to my colleague, Kelly Taxter, who is the um, Newman Curator of Contemporary Art at the Jewish Museum. Um, I'd like Kelly just to address, I think, the importance of the artist and the importance of his work and why um, this message is so timely. Um, 
So if, if Kelly could um, just Hello, have a have moment. I, I mean, to... Dave, haven't we finished with the applicant's presentation? Well, we finished with the applicant's presentation. We heard about the importance of the artist last time. Okay. However, I'll give you a little bit of leeway if you don't overdo it. Thank Kelly, you. can you be super quick? Uh, I, I can try that. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Thanks for hearing our proposal a second time um, in its revised and uh, reduced form. Um, for those of you in the public who are, are joining us and maybe weren't here last time, Lawrence Wiener is um, a pioneer in the conceptual and contemporary art uh, moment that we're in now. He began his career in the 1960s. Um, he's in New York born artist where he still lives and works in West Village. Um, but he grew up in the Bronx. And just to kind of in, emphasize the importance of the public nature of this piece, um, Lawrence, as well as Barnett Newman, who endowed, whose uh, legacy endowed my position, both learned about art and became artists strictly because of the availability of art on the streets of New York. And Lawrence thinks about that actively this piece is about that. It's about educating and connecting to people beyond the insides of museums, which costs money for people to enter, but really for everyone to access this from Fifth Avenue, from Central Park, from our public spaces. And that's an integral and really important part of this project that I hope is really clear. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Okay, we'll go to the committee. Why don't we go the reverse? All right. Um, so we'll start with Kim Salway. I'm going to unmute you, Kim. Um, my one question, I believe the last time we heard this presentation, we calculated that like the square footage of the penetrations to the facade was roughly seven feet. I believe Jane oversaw that. But I mean, but someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm estimating based on the quick math I was doing as the presenters were speaking that it's roughly about three feet, square feet. Is that correct? I don't know if the architect can tell us how much. Yeah. I, I just think it's helpful to help us gauge the impact to the front of the facade. Well, the impact is not from the amount of area that's covered by the bracket. The impact is, is, is what oh, penetrates right. the stone. And what, what David said is just exactly right. Three square feet per bracket. Anything else, Kim? It sounded like someone was about to answer my question in the background. The so. architect answered it, but please repeat it. What, would, what, okay. what David said is exactly right. I mean, the square footage uh, as a way of viewing this really is, is not um, applicable. It, 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 I don't think it really tells uh, much of a story, especially now that um, uh, for the mansion, all the anchor bolts are going to be going uh, through mortar joints and not through the, the body of the stone. Um, so, but I mean, if in fact the seven square feet was what the previous pre uh, proposal was, then that three or three and a half uh, square feet would be uh, about right. Okay, thank you, David. That answers my question. Next is Christina Davis. Thank you. Thank you, David and Jane. Uh, this is just astounding to me. First of all, I've lived in Carnegie Hill 45 years. So I have the historical perspective and Lo will know this as well. First of all, banners are not work of art. They announce exhibitions. If you come into the museum to look at that that banner. This is a work of art, it's not a banner. That's completely different. But I don't think the people who are speaking, <clears throat> and some of the people on the committee, some of the people are still on, the agony that we went to through to get the ability, that addition approved, which you're now covering up. Because our neighborhood is about architecture. That's what Carnegie Hill is about, Carnegie Hill Historic District. We have 51 individual landmarks. And the thought of drilling into that building, first of all, the first proposal that came to Landmarks, our committee and then the commission, 
was disapproved. The first banners that came to our committee and then the commission, they proposed three huge banners. We talked them into the one discrete one they have now. It, it was agonizing, months and months. So now to see this proposal of going into that facade that they ought to be so grateful they even have, if you'd seen the first proposal, to drill in to put a work of art, temporary work of art, just is astounding to me. Because if you walk up and down Fifth Avenue and see the great individual landmarks that line that avenue, you have to respect the facades and what we stand for in our neighborhood. Mr. Carnegie himself, who started our neighborhood. So, I, as you can tell, I cannot support this in any way whatsoever. And um, going into that facade, um, if, uh, you know, it's just astounding if you knew what the trouble we went through to get that facade and look to begin with. So maybe I'll think of more later, but that's my first response. Marco. No. Oh, now Marco. I thank you. Uh, well, uh, I think Christina said very well everything, what I was planning to say. And I think I absolutely agree with uh, um, Christina. And my biggest concern, obviously, is still in the penetrations that they put in jeopardy the stone that we don't know how skillful will be or how careful will be the contractor to install and make the penetration. And if the penetration that, that uh, there is a mistake, or oh, the stone has some problems at the time when they vibrate the, with the drill, it creates other kind of the situations. And the facade itself, Christina described very well now, uh, is this is the piece of art that we have to protect. And I think that is our role. And I 100% with Christina today, and the first time in all these years. And <laughs> uh, um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I guess Anthony's not with us. Sarah? Um, so I, 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 I deeply appreciate the perspective that Lo and Christina bring as residents in the neighborhood. And, um, and personally, I, f I feel like I need to be agnostic about the art itself because um, part of the function of art is the feelings that it evokes in people. And so um, whether that's, um, and, and so the art, the piece its side, um, the fact that it's temporary, I think is fitting given the, um, what a piece of art the building is. And so we wouldn't want that building to be constantly covered up. Uh, but my question, and I think the thing that, um, that concerns me the most is that um, these brackets, given the, the depth that they're going to be penetrating, it seems like they're going to be permanent, right? And so if they're permanent, that would open up um, the possibility of future banners. And whether those banners are temporary art pieces or um, if they're... Uh, Sarah, if, don't want yes? to cut you off. The brackets are temporary. They are not temporary. They it's are not, temporary. They everything, are temporary. Is, everything is temporary. Okay, then, um, then is there a plan in place to uh, address any of the structural problems that may arise? They have a patching system when they take out the bolts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm. All right. Um, I guess that it, it just doesn't make it any easier. Um, but I am deeply concerned about the impact of the building and um, and it, 
it's just so many brackets and um and the and with so much uncertainty that's it sarah alita alita thank you i just unmuted myself i'm, con I'm concerned about the holes into the, the facade even the more, but I'll let David address those because he's an oh, architect. Sorry, Alina, was... you know, please speak up. Oh, okay. So I, I'm concerned about the holes in the mortar and in the facade of the addition. I'll let David address those because he's an architect and has far greater understanding and Marco uh, did as well of the impact of these kinds of changes on the building structure. I, I don't know if you address this, and I have to ask you in my uh, capacity for architects, what is the time, for, how could this possibly be a construction? Um, so do you have a time frame that this would, this would go up? Uh, hold on one second, one second. You. I'm sorry, I have a noisy family in the background. Um, address the, the time frame for this. Um, the Someone? installation um, would be for approximately three months. That um, I, when would you anticipate um, this up? Probably if everything goes smoothly, we have a Landmarks Preservation Commission public hearing um, sometime in May. Um, and we would um, hope to start installation probably sometime this summer and continue through the fall, early fall. So it's assuming the city is open by then and construction projects that are non-essential and narrow are permitted. Yeah, there's, okay. there's, there's a lot of unknowns, but. Thank you. Thank you. I, I like the idea that it provides a framework for hope, even if it's subliminal. I think itself, the concept is important. I understand what low means, what Marco, what Christina mean. Um, in terms of the, the type of, uh, of material, the, the type of, not the message of the art, but the message of a banner is saying in a, a, a very dominantly in a completely residential neighborhood, except for the presence of other in an architectural sense and in an art sense museum. So I'm really torn on this one because I like the idea of art. I think it's important to look art that influence the artist itself is a great circle, um, has significance. But I am, con and if there weren't a question of damaging the, the building itself, either in putting it or taking it out or, or um, um, shaking from insulation or the intrusion of water, um, I would have no problem saying yes, which is the same reaction I had last time but I am concerned about the building. So again, I'll leave that to David and take my cue from him. And thank you very much for taking our concerns so to heart and spending these months revising it and coming back to the committee. Um, I'm very, very appreciative that you did all of that. So thank you. <clears throat> Michelle. Opposed to this. I thank you very much for going back and reconsidering the installation so that it would have less of an impact. But I have to tell you the fact that you proposed the original installation with its 150 anchors and not necessarily in the mortar joints really uh, undermines to me the feeling that you really have for the exterior of this building because <laughs> that was such a, um, an invasive thing to propose. And had we not disapproved it for the reasons that we did, that's what we'd be seeing now. And that would have been okay with all, with all of you uh, with the museum. That's very disturbing to me. Um, this is very invasive to the building and to the community. I see absolutely no benefit to it. 
The art is very nice. It's not quite as profound as you would like us to all think, at least in my opinion. And the message could be sent in many different ways. Uh, you could do a, a small light projection. You can wait until the museum can open and you can do something interior. You can drape your whole lobby in this if you would like. But to invade the community and the building um, it is absolutely outrageous to me. So I would not support this. Okay, Gail. Even though you have a system potentially of patching any holes that might have been created, you don't know what else the penetration might end up doing, damaging the facade. And living three blocks away from this museum, passing by it almost every day, it is such a work of art in itself. So even with a piece of art, a banner that may have an uplifting message at this point in time, I certainly don't think that it is appropriate to affix anything to the facade itself. I also believe that it does create a precedent and Museum Mile and Fifth Avenue are very special avenues. It's quite different, frankly, from Central Park West or from Lincoln Center. So I, I don't see that putting up this type of artwork would be an enhancement. And it certainly, I don't think would be a gift to the neighborhood. Elizabeth? Yeah, I'd be afraid of, uh, even though you say going to the mortar, mistakes happen all the time. And so I, I don't think that that's the solution. Um, and, I, I, I'm not an expert on hanging banners, that's for sure. But uh, with the museum closed, I don't see why you couldn't investigate doing it, uh, attaching it to something heavy and substantial many times. You've got windows there and hanging it uh, in the front uh, and perhaps making it... Uh, that you could take it in if it were very windy. Uh, but I can't support uh, cutting holes e even just in the mortar for this. I'm, I'm sorry. I wish I could, but I can't. Okay. Well, I said this the last time we saw this application. It's the Felix M. Warburg House. It's on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places. It's an individual landmark. It's located within the his, historic district, the Carnegie Hill Historic District. It's one of the great, great houses in our great city, which is suffering so much now. I don't care the art, the message of the art is totally irrelevant. This is a four month installation that would pierce the historic fabric of one of the great buildings in our great city. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> it sounds like it's going to be a, a disapproval. Uh, I would only say that uh, I have great respect for the technical expertise that the architects have brought to it. Uh, can you just tell me, I assume that, the, that what's ever going into the uh, walls are stainless? Yes. And the brackets themselves? The brackets will be galvanized. Well, um, I would have a small reservation on that, even though it's only four months. Uh, if it's not well done, you do have a potential for some rusting. They, um, they, can I just say they will be hot dip galvanized after fabrication? Okay. Um, but last but not least, um, what's interesting, and you pointed it out, is that uh, the new part of the building is actually uh, less capable of taking the bolts than the old part because, in effect, the old part has the eight inch thick uh, stone and the new part is only three inches with the cavity wall. And if for any reason 
uh, the patching doesn't work there and you are to replace the limestone, it's very, very difficult to get a perfect match of limestone, even though it's only, uh, what, 30 years. And um, the, uh, the problem that Elizabeth brings up of the possibility of mistakes, and I've been on too many construction jobs uh, where there are too many mistakes. Uh, I'd hate to see a mistake going into the facade of the old building, much less the new building. And much as I would like to support the museum and what I understand from their point of view is an important message, uh, I really come out being very conservative about wanting to touch the facade of the building. So uh, I don't think I could support it either. So I think we need a resolution from someone. David, Michelle has her hand raised. Want to give us a resolution, Michelle? Um, well, for its um, for the reasons, well, all the technical reasons about the impact on the integrity of the building, um, the size of it, the impact on the community, and that this is an individual landmark and it's also in a historic district, um, for all the reasons that we stated. Okay, do I get a second? Second. Okay, this okay. is a resolution to disapprove. A yes is a disapproval. Let's call the roll, please. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna do what I did last time and I'm gonna unmute each of you and then we'll go down the roll. So just hold tight for one second while I do that. Me? Yes. Uh, wait. Wait, Elizabeth, not yet. <laughs> okay, I believe I have everybody. Elizabeth Ashby, you said? Yes. Yes, and yes is a no. Yes. Gail Barron? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Alita? Oh, did I miss Alita? Did I miss Alita? Did she disappear? Alita, are you with us? Oh, there you are. I see. I see you waving. I can't find you on my screen. That's good. Uh, there you are. I'm sorry. For the moment. Yeah. Alita. Yes. <clears throat> sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay, but <laughs> thank you. Sarah. Yes. Uh, David. Yes. Jane. Yes. Marco? Yes. Christina? Yes. <clears throat> and Kim? Yes. Okay, that's everyone. Okay. Thank you. Sorry where it came out, but thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, anybody? Uh, have any don't dare business? you don't mention new business it's three hours it's now what three. happened to number well, we three have to, we have to ask it right jane was yeah. number three was number three withdrawn you, you voted three, on number three 34 30 60 70th street we voted on it in two parts no 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 number three was was 1083 fifth Oh, that's an old agenda. Okay, so that was withdrawn. Yeah. Are we going to hear? Okay. They'll come back later. They they didn't want to do a Zoom um, presentation. Okay, no new no. business, no old business. <laughs> I, have a, I just have I have a com yeah I just have a comment about. Um, the one that uh, we were not supposed to be considering the rooftop that in whatever your comments are that you can just mention it. Uh, Michelle, I'm writing up that resolution and that the roof, um, the additions to the roof were decided at the staff level. So I'm not gonna mention it in the resolution. Thank you. I would agree as the co-chair. <clears throat> 
Anything else? Can I just want to adjourn. I, no, wait, wait, wait. Hang on one second. Be forget, and because the board meeting is so close, David and Jane, when you do this, just include some photo or drawings or something for the benefit of the board members who are just going to be looking at the screen and have you in the front of the room, um, just to make it more understandable and and well. You know, um, Will, are you still there? I am. I will, there's one, only one photograph you need to include for um, the East 70th Street application. It's the one of the existing condition for the front elevation and the one of the proposed. I will send you the page number and that's what you could include, but I'll send you the page number. You know, I have to do my remote learning tomorrow morning as a school teacher. So I'm ready to sign off, but I will try to get my resolutions in by five tomorrow afternoon. Alita, uh, one last thing on a letter that we had agreed should go to landmarks about our commenting on things that are approved at the staff level. Where is that in our conversation? I'm going to have sorry. to. Stop. I'm very sorry, but I'm, okay. I, I'm really. I have to leave also. So uh, just talk to Michelle separately, but thank you so much, Dave and Jane. Thank you. Oh, well, um, thank you, Alita, and thank you, Will. Will, you better Thank you, Will. I told you he would be great at this. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to take a good night. This is a lot of work, Michelle. Will. Thank you. Bye. I just Thank want you. to ask Michelle for a second. <clears throat> then at the letter, Landmarks was supposed to come before Borough Board. The letter went to all of the community boards through Borough Board. There was a, a general consensus that we want Landmarks to come, they were going to come to the March Borough Board and then there was no March Borough Board. Today we had our two and a half hour meeting, with no presentations at all. So I, it went out, I, it went out um, and it is an issue and they were going to bring in Marks to discuss it. It did go, right Bill? All that I time? So I, I'm we're, sorry, we're you, you broke letter, up. Right? One second, you broke up. It went out to the borough boards or it no, went it to went, landmarks? It went, I believe it went to landmarks. Will oh. the letter on the staff approval? This is the one that has everybody, like all the no, other community boards the on it? That, the, I think the one that we that we sent. Um, let we, me we see what we it, sent. Because you sent something. We sent well, I have to pull out. Okay, you go ahead, David. Thank you. Right. Good night, everyone. Good night, and thank you. Good night. I'll, I can quickly pull up what we sent. Um, it was the long letter on staff approvals. I don't think that ever went out, Alita. No, I think that went okay, to Borough Board. Because I sent it to Borough Board for get You're waiting else. for sign on for the rest of the. So I will, I will, I'm looking for a pen, which I don't have. I will send um, everything got got delayed. It was going to go and get signed up to by boards. Landmarks was going to come, and then all of this happens. So um, I will send we'll send it out to landmarks. All of the other to mm -hmm. landmarks. You'll send it directly to landmarks. We'll send it directly to landmarks, right. and because the others can always come on board later if they so well, I choose. don't want I don't want it to I don't want it to wait. One of the one of the things that a lot of the community board said this morning in borough board trying to behave as though it's business as normal and usual because the agencies are continuing many of them and more exactly. of them. Exactly. So you're right. Thank you for reminding me. I'm sorry for the lapse. Thought it went, and then I and then actually will reminded me we were going to get other boards who were interested to sign on to this. And thank I you. It got delayed. So Isabel, I assume Isabel that's on here is Isabel from the borough president's office. Are you still exactly. around? If so, can I unmute you and maybe you say something? Isabel. Yeah, left. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> scared her off. She there, she's not there. It's no, late. she's not there anymore. I scared her off. No, it's, oh, I it's I mean, she, she's actually hour, still on. But the three-hour time frame, I think, probably scared her off. <laughs> Fair. Will, so, thank you very I'll, much. I'll, this I'll, is you, without you, it wouldn't have gone smoothly at all. So we, 
I realize now you're a regular attendee of every single committee and every single meeting and every single forum and every single conference. So I thank you very, very much. We couldn't have them without you. Oh, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Well, let's talk about the roll call thing because I think the second thing you did was worked better, but we could talk about that tomorrow. Thank you everyone for putting up with this after hours to chat. Thank so you. Well, I'm Good sorry night. how hard you worked on that letter. I don't want to put it down, so we will send it out. Great. Good night. Also, Thank you. Good night. One last plug. Tomorrow uh, there is a social gathering hour. Um, give me two seconds. I'm going to send it out later, but I do want to plug it <clears throat> that it starts at 2 p.m. So if anybody else. Can we make it later? Your... If we make it later, then there's a chance that I could join. Uh, it, it then it runs into our call and the Department of Homeless Services five. call. You have a four o'clock, you said. Yeah. I thought our call was at five. Yeah. So, so what if we do it at two thirty. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could always join. It doesn't matter, and that's fine. I just think it's nice to have them. Just, Will uh, I also ha after the last forums, I had requested of Rebecca and um, Keith that they do a forum on education because I think it's a really critical thing what's going on in the city. Rebecca great, gracefully answered and she's scheduling one for April 28. So we don't have the exact time and detail yet, but I just wanted to urge you to make sure that a really good email blast goes out to that and uh, to the extent that you have the public schools or the PTAs or whatever, because everybody is very concerned about the schools and how all this online stuff is being handled. And no real questions have been answered about the specifics. So I'm hoping we're gonna get them at that forum. So I wanna be sure everybody knows about it. That's great. Okay. As a parent, I co-sign with that. <laughs> Okay. Good okay. night. <laughs> thank Good you. Night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for being a troop here, super trooper, a, a Ninja Turtles trooper, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles trooper, and 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 staying for these meetings and working hard after whole day. So thank you. Right. Of the Stop board. recording while we're talking about uh, <laughs> Abba songs. But thank you for putting Super Trooper in my head. Now that I've uh, I have.